Um, so I'm calling the Committee of the Whole meeting to order on Monday, May 7th at 6 p.m. Um, before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. So that brings us to the first item, approval of the agenda. Move approval. Uh, seconder. Seconder. Just if you can add that announcement for the neighborhood challenge. So sorry, are we, I'm confused, are we adding that? Uh, we're, we're still in motion, we're still approving that agenda. Do you need it added to the agenda? We're just going to put it in just ahead of the public participation, just the announcement. We have the Great Colwood Neighborhood Challenge to announce. So uh, nobody's made a motion to amend, so. He did. Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. I well, we don't have a second. Then. We don't need, oh, don't need it for committee. That's so all those in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Carried. Second adoption of the minutes. We have one set of minutes. Committee of the whole meeting uh, for March 19th, 2018. All those in favor? Opposed? None carried. And uh, we'll have the announcement. Sure thing. Uh, so we've um, had a number of entries. There was 24 neighborhood entries for the Great Colwood Neighborhood Challenge. This is all in support of uh, Neighborhood Day, which was actually on the weekend. Uh, we had a total of 24 neighborhoods, 1,700 in votes, 4,300 visits to the contest and two winners. So with the popular choice of Addie Road um, off of Kelly with 788 votes and following that were three separate entries all uh, touting Wood End Place and Road for a total of 608. So each of those neighborhoods will win a block party prize pack with foods and treats and games and tables and signs and all that sort of thing. So uh, staff will be contacting those uh, that uh, submitted those nominations and making arrangements. So stay tuned to what's going on in their neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that brings us to our third item, public participation. So this is your chance to give any feedback or comments, please remember to state your name and address. Hi, um, Judith Allen, uh, 3333 Anchorage Avenue, down by the lagoon. Um, I'm gonna make this short because I know there's a lot of people who wanna talk uh, and I'll probably read most of this because I don't like speaking in public. So. Um, uh, my main concern is the closure of Ocean Boulevard, the possibility as I believe it would cause uh, serious safety concerns for residents in the lagoon area. It's just one of two ways out of the area, and there are emergency scenarios such as a fire, a gas leak, slope instability from an earthquake, which could make it impossible uh, to exit the area up the Matrosan Roadway and leave residents stranded unnecessarily. We are told to have two ways out of our house in emergency, and the same applies to a neighborhood. In addition to safety concerns, closing, closing Ocean Boulevard in the middle would limit access to the washrooms for half the beach area. Many motorists would simply drive around the sand dunes to avoid the gate, and the barrier could not be extended down to the beach because of damage from winter storms. Closing Ocean Boulevard at the bridge would bring excessive traffic down Lagoon and Milburn and be frustrating for both beach uh, visitors and locals. There are easier and safer ways to reduce traffic and speeding. Um, we need to decide whether we want to, one, slow down traffic or two, reroute commuter traffic in two different er uh, matters. As to slowing down traffic, a simpler and cheaper solution that could be done quickly would be to put a couple of stop signs along both Melbourne and Lagoon roads at the appropriate spots. In order to reroute uh, commuter traffic, uh, signs that said no right turn from 7 to 8.30 in the morning except for residents could be put on Machosan Road at both Hatley and Lagoon Roads. This is done in many cities uh, to protect residential areas from, commercial, from uh, computer, uh, commuter traffic. 
Residents are issued stickers for their cars, allowing them access to their own street. A similar sign could be put on Ocean Boulevard at Belmont to prevent for going the other way. Uh, keys to these solutions is enforcement. You don't need a constant uh, police presence near these signs. Occasional and random visits by police will deter people from breaking the law in order to avoid a possible ticket. Surely it's possible to arrange something occasional with the RCMP because we're paying for the policing services. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, Doug Willoughby on H. Mink Drive Road. Um, I pretty much have to agree with what Judith has said about the uh, blocking of uh, Ocean Boulevard does present a lot of problems. In addition, uh, the lack of police presence and patrolling is significant. Uh, the only time you ever see police either on Ocean Boulevard or on Milburn is either for a, a uh, good media photo op or very rarely as they're driving through. Um, the evenings are, it turns Ocean Boulevard into a speed zone. Kids are down there with their cars, drag racing. Everybody knows that. It's very dangerous. Driving on Milburn, I've been passed numerous times during the day. And once the last time was a guy driving a large 4x4 pulling a construction trailer. Parked cars on both sides. And, uh, you know, there was little room. If anybody had been walking, we could well be dealing with a fatality. So I think... Putting stop signs in is a good thing. I think putting speed cushions in is a good thing. There was, back in March of 2016, a proposal brought to council to put in speed cushions on Ocean Boulevard. That was actually objected to by one councillor that it was going to affect their commute. Uh, that idea was put off to staff to study and I've yet to see any results of that study. We have another potential study happening here with one suggestion having a plebiscite, which I think is ridiculous. That would put it off until the October 20th uh, municipal elections, which would probably bring up another study and we would be dealing with this again a year from now. I think something has to be done and done soon. Thank you. Martin at 301 Milburn and I live actually at Milburn Drive in Hatley right on the corner. One of the options I think you should be done is because of that hill going up Hatley there's a blind hillside at the top and the corner at Hatley and Milburn roughly every year four cars hit my stone wall. Sunday yesterday afternoon nice sunny day guy came around the corner there's a little ditch in front of my house boom into the ditch. It should be blocked off right up at the top. So as you swing, as, 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 you, as you come in, I forget the name of the road. I think it's Hatley comes around the whole thing. You know, there's a new subdivision that's been built. It should be a circle there. It should be a blocked off so only residential traffic can go up Hatley, which would stop all by everybody coming up Milburn. So they would only go up Lagoon Road. And like he's, the gentleman said here, you put speed bumps along Lo Ocean Boulevard. Every 50 feet or 60 feet, that's going to slow people right down. Case closed. Because you can't put a speed bump on a hill. Because if you hit a speed bump at too high a speed, you're going airborne. Then you become a danger. So simple, that would slow down the traffic from commuting. Because I can tell you right now, if you put one of those counters in front of my house, on the average morning commute, there's probably 300 cars, 400 cars that go by my corner. And it's really, I'm amazed there hasn't been a major, major accident there at that corner. Especially with people... Weekends, people are biking up that hill. They're walking up that hill. Cars are coming down too steep down that steep hill. That's what I think you should do. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Philip Nurse. I'm the general manager representing Royal Colwood Golf Club. I'm just here to speak on the item number tonight, which is 4.2, which is the recommendations from staff on the Urban Forest Task Force uh, that was submitted last month. Um, 
Before I begin, I just want to say a few things. Personally, I preach counsel all the work that you do within the community, and we feel proud of that and, and for all the challenges that you guys have, both on the staff level and councils as well. Um, I did attend the Urban Task Force Committee meeting on February 15th of this year. Um, I admitted throughout that report in a sense of raising my concerns with the, the, the new bylaw that was put on by the city. I acknowledge in the bylaw, I understand the reasoning behind that, but I was concerned on a Royal College perspective out of 154, 165 acres and the 4,000 trees that we do have on the property of what this meant to us. Um, there was a recommendation from the task force that, that it was recommended that RCGC work with the staff of Colwood and work together on agreement on a management plan. Um, I met with Mr. Preston and Mr. Carlson on last Thursday um, briefly. They said that the recommendation from staff will be made public on Friday, uh, which is great, um, which I had the chance to review on the weekend. I was a little bit, um, I would say, discouraged, to say the least, on that end of it, on the recommendation from staff, and I didn't feel that any of the recommendations from staff benefited us or even acknowledged Royal Colwood in a great manner. Um, you know, having one of the largest forest areas within the municipality, um, there was no consultation at all with us. Um, I've been driving this since the start of this to make sure that we were acknowledged in some way, shape, or form, having concerns about where the trees were. Um, you know, the number of trees that's been recommended on 30 centimeters probably is irrelevant. I don't have any trees under 30 centimeters on the property, realizing that it is a large forested area. So that's certainly hindrance number one. The planting, the planting ratio is a concern as well, one for one or two for one, based on how many you remove at the time, certainly can cause issues, especially for futures as well. Um, we do manage our groves. Um, we have an intensive forest vegetation plan, which the city was provided when this council was put, or when the urban task force was put together. Um, and it was acknowledged to that end of it. Um, we manage the official plan to based on our management forest plan and what is removed, what is planted on an ongoing basis. We are one of the largest forest grove areas within the municipality, and we are trying to meet the objectives of protecting the staff, the members, and the guests through, through tree removal and planting as well. Um, this bylaw affects our business substantially on a cost factor as well and on the playability as a business. Um, from our position, I don't believe the bylaw draft uh, makes any accommodations for us and how to f manage our forest estate on the property. Um, and that's why I'm here tonight to see the recommendation from council. So thanks for your time. Was there anyone else who wanted to speak? Hi, my name's Craig Booth. I live in the 200 block of Millboro Drive. You know, the lack of action by the city is having a negative effect on the enjoyment of our property. It is also affecting the value of our property due to the volume and speed of the traffic. In my estimation, as to the vehicle speeds, most local residents do not speed on their, in their neighborhood roads. And this would account for approximately 80 to 100 vehicles not speeding per day. I don't know if that was taken into account in the non-speeding section or not. And I'd also like to know why <coughs> any of the suggested measures <coughs> did not include enforcement either by the RCMP or our own bylaw officers in enforcing the current speed bylaw. Most people don't speed when there is a risk of being ticketed or fined. Also, the volume of traffic is having a deteriorate, deteriorating effect on the condition of Milburn Drive and posing a significant safety threat to pedestrians and the local wild, wildlife. Lastly, I'd like to know if anyone from City Hall has been in the 200 block of Millburn Drive to visually witness the traffic flows and speeds between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning or 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the evening, Monday to Friday. Thank you. My name is Jerry Malota. I live at 151 Milburn. 
I walk almost every day from my house up to the bridge and back. It takes me approximately 45 minutes. In 1960, <laughs> 2016, I account the cars which goes past towards downtown or town. It was 182 cars. Last year, I count 227 cars. And this year, I count 337 cars within 45 minutes, which is span between 7 and 7.45. So <coughs> the Royal Bay, it's not building up yet. So after the Royal Bay will be built up within five years, the cars will increase at least up to 400 or more. So I see the solution, if we can block Ocean Boulevard halfway and put a gate for city workers to go by and pick up the garbage from the bins, so this way, there will be no true traffic. That means there will be no speeding on Milburn, there will be no speeding on Ocean Boulevard, and no speeding on Lagoon Road. So I would suggest that the council would feel that in consideration and look a little bit further years. Thank you. Was there anyone else? Good evening. My name is Susan McDonald, and I live at 209 Milburn. So that's right on the corner of Milburn and Haloha, just below the electronic food plant. So the first thing I'd like to point out, just something that kind of got under my skin a little. Um, in the report by the engineers, it refers to the fact that residents are um, complaining about the overall quality of life being negatively impacted. I submit that it's a lot more than that. We're worried about our safety. We've seen cars going uphill, uphill at 90. Yesterday afternoon, one of those motorcycles where you lean forward, I think they call it a crotch rocket or something, it went up the hill so fast that even though I was standing in my driveway looking at the road, I couldn't tell you if it was a man or a woman or what color that motorcycle was. It was just a blur. And yes, there is a lot of speed first thing in the morning and, and during the rush hour traffic, but in the afternoons when there's no volume to slow people down, that's when it's really, really excessive. And that's usually about the time that the kids are coming home from school. Anyway, going forward from that, I recognize that this council has inherited the problems that have come from short-sighted planning of other councils. And, and you're stuck with it, <laughs> it's too bad. You're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And I urge you to look carefully at the root of the cause. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think one of the major roots of the cause is my chosen road. As an artery, it's a dismal failure. It has bottlenecks and uh, speed zones and schools and it's narrow and people don't want to go that way. So they come down through our neighborhood. If you divert them from our neighborhood, you then have all that traffic going through there. And I know it's, it's a problem the way it is without the extra traffic. So I see where you're stuck. And I wonder, maybe this isn't possible, could you approach the school board. Would the school board consider maybe selling Sangster to a developer? And with that money, they could enlarge the two schools on either ends of Wishart? Or better yet, maybe they could build a brand new one down in the Royal Bay area. You could then close off the back entrance of Gunsmuir, and you could eliminate that speed zone. You could likely even widen the road 
And then instead of throwing good money after bad with Band-Aid solutions, you're addressing the root of the problem. It's just, just a thought. I don't know if there's any merit to it or not, but I feel like you need to look at the root of the problem. I urge you to do something expeditiously for us because it is not safe in our neighborhood, and we do need something done urgently. But also maybe look down the future because as has been mentioned, Royal Bay is going to get bigger. Where is that traffic going to go? They won't go to Latoria and up Veterans Memorial. It feels like they're going in the wrong direction, and they won't do it. So anyway, maybe that's a little off the wall, but thank you for listening. I'm sorry, Beth Mitchell, 3504 Aloha. Um, I've given each of you a letter concerning uh, my concerns and, and actually some suggestions for some pretty cheap and quick fixes. But the most important thing I see is filling in the ditch on Milburn and paving that. I know it's not environmentally a great plan, but I think it's time to do that. Um, and to make a walking, a safe walking area on Milburn, right from Lagoon Road intersection, right down um, from, I'm not sure, from, I think from Aloha down, the road is filled in, but the ditches are so deep that people can't pass them. They can't dive into the ditch if there's something like a bus coming towards them. And with parking along Milburn, there's trucks and cars in areas that are parked half in the ditch and half on the road. So any pedestrian walking up the street, particularly in the morning at school time, um, there are parents who are walking their children up Milburn, and uh, they have nowhere to go. They have to walk out in the main roadway with buses coming at them, fast traffic coming at them. They can't go in the ditch. They have no way to safely get up that road. Um, the same goes for... Um, Lagoon Road from Heather Bell down to approximately um, Goldfinch, where that road, that sidewalk, the pedestrian walkway there, needs to be paved and raised. Every day, um, there are school groups going down there, particularly this time of year, um, and partic particularly the environmental kindergarten kids. Um, they're, you know, they're stumbling around on, on the gravel road. They step, there's no clear de definition between road and, and sidewalk there. It's just gravel. It's not sidewalk, and it should have at least a raised um, paved area, such as you've done on Heather Bell itself. Um, for the safety of families, um, particularly there are some uh, young families right now with children who are in either wagons or strollers, and they walk down there, and they have a heck of a time keeping track of a dog and two kids and um, walking on that gravel area. So that's something that needs to be addressed quickly. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Did anyone else have comments? Cynthia Albers, 276 Milburn Drive. Um, I don't envy you guys. I know that you have a tough task ahead of you. Um, I would like to know more about the sustainability of Ocean Boulevard. It's man-made, it's eroding. Um, there's costs to maintaining this and it's being used as a highway. So I would like to see the city put more information out there so that we can get educated on the cost, um, the long-term plan, um, and whether it's sustainable. Um, I'm also in agreement with uh, the possibility of closing Hatley down because the, the traffic is just, it's unbelievable. We've had a nightmare of a time trying to get out of our driveway. Um, I have, yeah. I, I have already said to Councillor Day and Councillor Nolt that we've had horns blown at us, we've had hand gestures, just trying to get out of our driveway in the morning. It's not safe. So I thank you for your consideration and I hope that we can get some more information on um, the sustainability of Ocean Boulevard.
Was there anyone else wanting to come and speak? Asking a second time. No? Okay, that is the end of public participation. Thank you everyone for your comments. So that brings us next to old business. So we have a 4.1 um, report from the Director of Engineer and Public Works regarding the traffic calming options for the Lagoon neighborhood. Thank you to both uh, committee and uh, residents uh, through the chair. The committee and audience has before them a report that outlines an overview of the data um, obtained by the speed reader boards located on Lagoon Road in Milburn Drive and uh, the conundrum facing council, residents, and staff with regard to effective calming measures to mitigate cut through traffic volume speeds in the Lagoon, Lagoon neighborhood. There is definitely no easy fix and any successful calming measures will have a corresponding trade-off. Um, and that corresponding trade-off may likely impact residents in a far more wide-ranging area than the Lagoon neighborhood. If I may, uh, I would like to step everyone present through the 11 scenarios that are located in the report, noted as attachment A, to help everyone visualize on the map what uh, we did think about when we um, brought forward this report. Can everybody hear me here? Perfect. So I think uh, one of the, I'll, I'll go through uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, not neighborhood by neighborhood, road by road, my apologies. Um, so the first scenario that um, was considered and, and that residents um, have definitely asked for in the past would be to place uh, speed humps or cushions on Milburn Drive to try to stop traffic. The, the trouble for us is um, to be able to put speed humps along Milburn. I'll let's see if I can get this mouse to work here. Uh, we've got a problem. Oh, here we go. Um, there are significant grade differences in, in Milburn on Milburn Drive. So, and placing um, speed humps or cushions um, above 8% is definitely frowned upon for, for the very reasons that um, a resident also spoke about. We, yeah, we would definitely launch some people. So, um, there are some areas that we, that we could place them, but you'll, you'll see what the, the difficulty is. So, right here, we could place them. It's about a 5.9% grade. Um, the next block up, however, um, we would have a difficulty because it's almost at 8% already. That's 7.5%. Uh, next block up, we're looking at 11%, over 11%. And then here, we're looking at, at another 75 So we're very close to that 8 So that, that definitely provides a lot of trouble for speed humps on Melbourne. If you move over to Lagoon, um, the, the problem is simply... Um, if we start placing speed humps along Lagoon in the areas that we could place speed humps, um, so for example, where this is 11% on Milburn, this is only 5.4% on Lagoon, the trouble is, is we're going to have, we're going to start the route running through other streets as traffic avoids any speed humps that we would put here and starts route running back through here and then back into um, Milburn where we can't place this, the same thing. So then you've, you've got a zigzag pattern through the neighborhood, which is definitely not ideal. So the other, um, the next uh, option we thought was, okay, if we can't have speed humps, maybe we could simply chicane down here. So chicaning would be sort of moving traffic from one side of the road to the other, um, which we, we could do. The trouble is, is that, um, they're, in order for them to be effective, you have to have pretty much the same number of vehicles traveling in both directions to be able to stop people from just simply going on that side of the road and uh, speeding down. And unfortunately for Milburn, um, the data does not show the volume of traffic moving in both directions at the same time. So you definitely have a, um, a problem with the morning commute coming down and the evening commute going up 
And during those two times, there's just not enough traffic to really chicane effectively. So that, that was a problem. Um, I have, uh, we don't have in this uh, graphic, but we did consider um, what many people have brought forward this morning, or sorry, this evening, which is um, stop signs at each location. The trouble that we run into is stop signs, so all stop signs say all along here and all along here. Where you're going to run into difficulty is um, studies show that if you try to use four-way stops as a traffic calming measure, what tends to happen is people run right through them. So they either ignore them, not unlike um, what everybody in the room has seen with lowering the traffic speed. If people don't want to obey a sign, they tend not to. And so you have the problem of lowering speeds in an attempt to get people to slow down, and law-abiding citizens will slow down. But the people who don't think that there's a reason to slow down to 30 aren't going to do that. And the same problem goes with signs. So um, studies have shown that if you're trying to use four-way stops for traffic calming, what happens is about 50% of people will do the California-style stop, so they're not really stopping, they're just kind of going up to it, slowing down maybe. Another 25% don't stop at all. They just figure they're gonna go through it and that is what it is. So, so now you've got a 75% compliance problem right off the bat. Even if you, even if you had the police presence, which we, we, we know we don't have. So the signs aren't on here simply because of, of that. It, it's not that we didn't think about it, it's, it's just that it, it didn't seem to be very effective. The other problem with signs is you have pedestrians thinking people are actually going to do it and there's a false sense of security. And the last thing you wanna do is have somebody step out on the road thinking there's a sign there and then get taken out, so. So signs are, are definitely a problem. Um, we did look at uh, converting Milburn Drive to one way to try to reduce the volume, but again, that would only reduce it in a single direction, so you're, you're, not re you're only reducing volume either in the morning or in the afternoon, not both, which, would, which isn't very helpful. Um, Lagoon Road, so the fourth option, You okay? Sorry, no, I, I can stop. I just, <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. Um, Lagoon Road uh, is a collector road, so we were um, thinking about speed humps or cushions on that, but I've already gone through. The places that we could actually place them on Lagoon is, is simply going to start cutting traffic through roads that currently don't have as much of a problem as, as both Melbourne and Lagoon. So that, that in and of itself is, is problematic. Um, and we looked at uh, chicanes as well um, for Lagoon Road. Um, so chicanes may be effective on Lagoon because there is actually quite a, num a number of vehicles going in both directions. The trouble is, is we're just gonna push everything off in side streets once again to Melbourne. So it's, it's not helping the neighborhood, it's just moving traffic from one location to the other. And, and that's not gonna help overall. It's, it's only gonna help on the parts that it helps on. So, so that is uh, pretty tricky for us. Um, we could uh, construct a traffic circle on Lagoon Road at Aloha Avenue. It's nice big wide there. Um, the trouble is, is it's not gonna stop anybody from racing up from that or down to it. It'll, it'll simply just be there. It also could push, again, traffic onto those side streets that come out and on, back again onto Melbourne, which is not ideal. Um, we did have um, item number seven, which, which um, you had also spoke about, yeah, which was uh, closing Hatley Drive to through traffic. Um, so that definitely, um, would eliminate uh, commuter cut through traffic on Hatley Drive, which is also significantly impacted. Um, and it would um, probably eliminate a significant portion of the commuter cut through traffic on, onto Milburn Drive. And um, so we're talking right around here. 
and then it would prevent traffic from this, this corner, which we also agree is, is not ideal. So then what would happen is you wouldn't have people zipping along here, using this as a cut through route, and then this ending up on this, this really kind of nasty corner right here. Up here. Sorry, excuse me. Um, if you have a comment, that's great, but you do need to use the mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Anyway, now because there's a couple sidewalks there, like Milburn is crazy. Like you've got 50 feet of sidewalk, and then you've got ditch, and then you've got another 20 feet. So with the sidewalk there, cars are now parked seeming more narrow. There's like there's a funnel there, mm -hmm. and that corner at that Hatley and at Milburn, I can say I. During the rush hour, it's crazy there. It's just both sides at between like seven and actually six to six o'clock until about nine thirty. It's nuts, and between about four o'clock until six o'clock, it's crazy there. Weekends, it's worse because in other ways, it's because you have a lot of people biking in that area. Great place to bike, mm -hmm. and come around that corner, and you got cars almost hitting bikes every weekend in the summertime, from because it's got also the road it's got a lot of gravel on it like little stones so people are sliding i've seen people take out the, or hit the stop sign go in the ditches it's 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 a common show right there thank you so so yes um the the seventh one was was essentially to um somehow block off hatley to this cut through up here and yes it would mitigate some of this this problem um, as well, because you're not going to have the volume of cars coming this way. Um, what it wouldn't do is address speeding on Lagoon Road, and so people may simply go up here and then cruise themselves on down <coughs> to on Lagoon Road. So there will be um, whatever doesn't flow through here is going to push up like water and just flow down this way. So. It definitely would stop some of this, but there are some knock-on effects, and those knock-on effects are going to be over here. Yes. But um, if I'm, I'm just going to go through all the options first, and then we can we can talk about how perhaps we can do multiple things. But yes, we could do something here, and then something here. But the trouble is, is that again, all of these things that we could do along here are still going to push things over here. So we're still going to have a volume problem no matter what we do with these ones so far. Um, we're also going to potentially add traffic to these streets, which currently don't have the big issues that these through streets do. So, yes, we can look at multiple, mul multiple areas, but it's still going to affect the whole. Sorry, just, just for everyone, if we could just let Nikki uh, finish her report, please, and I would be happy to give you an opportunity at the end for your comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the other thing um, that we considered was converting to a one-way route this uh, Hatley along here. So instead of traffic being two-way, it from here this way, it would be one-way traffic, which would eliminate a lot of this and then potentially uh, help this corner as well. Um, again, it, it doesn't address um, speeding on Lagoon Road. It definitely um, would, both of those those things would prevent people who normally would be living on, on say, here and anywhere along here from 
taking a nice easy route to the beach as well and because it is it is their way of, of getting there as well so anybody living here who wanted to go to the beach with a vehicle would come up so it, it would be a bit of a trade-off there um, then we've got Ocean Boulevard and the speed humps or speed cushions so which is basically um, putting all our our uh, traffic calming eggs along here. So um, a couple of things um, that would uh, be problematic. Um, if we only put things here, we're, we're not dealing with the cut through that comes here. We're not dealing with the cut through and speeding once um, commuters get past this point. So it could inadvertently increase speeds coming down because you're trying to make up for lost time um, as you go across here because you know that that's going to be slower so there there could well in there could well be some unintended consequences there where people speed more um, which definitely isn't ideal and that would be on both of these these routes um, the other problem is if we put speed humps or bumps or cushions along here um, anybody who's trying to park is going to have to navigate around those bumps as well because you're, we have to have them over far enough that people don't just go around them, in which case we'd have to extend them into where people now park. Otherwise, they're just going to go right around those. So that um, would be problematic. Uh, the other thing is, is to put um, a permanent series of speed humps along here. Um, we would have to dig into the ground here so there would be some um, archaeological concerns that we would have to address. I mean, they're not insurmountable, but they do take time. Um, and we're not entirely certain that simply putting speed humps along here is going to address the bigger issue up here. So that, that is a bit of a conundrum. Um, and then we get to the sort of closing of this. Um, and that would be either at uh, the lagoon... Uh, Esquimalt Lagoon Bridge, which um, has been closed in the past uh, temporarily, um, or it would be sort of midway. So the midway um, point was uh, discussed and thought about because at least if it was if we closed Ocean Boulevard here to through traffic, um, you eliminate the cut through through here off the bat because there's nowhere to go. Everybody who's cutting through is trying to get to here. So that would stop cut through, and it will stop people who are speeding from outside the neighborhood to here. Um, and it, if, if there's nowhere to go besides the beach, then that's really the only destination going this way. The reason that we were thinking um, the midway point is if you come from the other direction to the beach, which is it's an amenity and it's, it's a local attraction, at least people could also come through to the beach from the other direction and be able to park, be able to enjoy the amenity that's over here. So that was the, the main premise behind closing or having some kind of obstruction here. Um, and, and it would be effective. Whether or not it's palatable is another, is another conundrum, but it would be effective. Um, Similarly, um, a lagoon bridge has been closed in the past, so um, it could be closed there as well. The trouble with that, I mean, it gives you all the benefits um, of not having the cut through commuter speeding and, and volumes, um, but it does really limit um, the ability for anybody coming from the opposite direction to go to the beach, and it would increase uh, traffic to the beach through the neighborhood again. Um, and it would be quite problematic for people to park on the other side. And then that would be a very long walk, absolutely. Um, and the last one that's uh, in, a, in the attachment is, um, sorry, I'll just catch up with my slides here, would be to um, convert Ocean Boulevard to one way going this way. Um, that will be problematic in the opposite direction, so it doesn't really solve that afternoon rush coming up this way. Um, but it does allow people to um, 
come home that way if they live in this neighborhood. Um, it's a bit tricky, uh, mainly because we would have to uh, maintain a access point that would be wide enough for a fire truck to go through because if it's not a through, if it's not a gate that they can easily just open and go through, um, we would have to maintain some sort of access route for fire. So there'd be a, there'd be a fair amount of um, infrastructure that would have to go into that. Again, not insurmountable, um, but it, it really is only going to work in one direction as well. So it it wasn't ideal. So at the end of the day, that's that's how we got to the you know maybe not palatable, but the most effective way to deal with cut through traffic and volume, still recognize that people want to come to the beach and um, it is a destination, would be to somehow block a th through traffic um, midway point. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nikki. Um, so before I bring this back to you, committee, I will give the public a chance to have or ask some questions or comments. Please remember to use the mic and you still need to state your name and address, please. Yeah, Doug Willoughby. Um, I think blocking off uh, Hatley or restricting traffic off of Mo uh, Machosan Road at certain times, except for residents, is a good way to start. That's going to make people go down Lagoon Road have a rather than going down Hatley and on to Melbourne. I think if you restrict the water flow, as it is, more people are just going to say, I'm just going to go along the Chosen to Souk Road and get into that flow. Putting some speed cushions or something on Lagoon will further slow them down, and it'll discourage a, at least a few people. We have somebody who said that they're getting, you know, uh, 300 cars in 45 minutes. Um, I mean, that's getting a bit ridiculous down in that area. I think there has to be something. Blocking off of, you know, uh, Ocean Boulevard, I don't know if that's a good idea because of the access for, you know, fire, et cetera. I do think that increased policing of that, either by RCMP or by bylaw, is absolutely something that should be looked at. Thank you. I hear a lot of what we can't do and what we can't do and we can't do this and we can't do this. If you close off that part of Hatley, you put a couple speed bumps on Lagoon Road and then you put a light at Lagoon Road and, and Machosan, it'll slow people coming up the hill because everybody's going to have to wait for the light. And after a while, they'll say, God, we're waiting 10 more minutes here for the stupid light. They'll say, oh, why don't I just go down Machosan Road and it'll discourage people taking Lagoon Road altogether. If you have to block off, say put a blockage, like a gate in the middle of the, the Ocean Boulevard, then just maybe block it off during the rush hour. We do have staff who go around doing other stuff in that time of day, so somebody unlock the gate, and during the weekend, leave it open, because that's not the problem during the weekend, usually for traffic going up Lagoon Road. Because people still want to come to the beach, especially now with all the artwork down there. It's pretty cool. But during rush hour, it seems to be the problem, both at in the morning and at night. So if you block off Ocean Boulevard, you're basically saying you're going to go down the Chosen Road or Memorial Way, and that's it. You're not going to be allowed to go down those roads. And it takes, what, five minutes to lock the gate? I see the by officer down there all the time on the way home myself, because that's where I come through. So they are down there, so there's no problem for them to lock up the gate and then unlock it after rush hour, which, which you know, takes care of the problem. Thank you. Thanks. Did anyone else have questions or comments? My name is Lee Cathcart, and I'm at 3322 Aloha. Uh, the issue that I always have is that uh, people cut uh, down Aloha, um, and I walk my dog there every morning, and uh, they come whizzing around the corner, and it's, it's, it can be quite scary. So 
we walk at 5 a.m. now, uh, <laughs> which isn't super ideal for me. Um, my wife and I are pretty nervous about blocking off Ocean Boulevard. Um, we're local there, and part of the draw to our day is when we finish our work day is that we get to drive along the water and we get to see those mountains. Um, so it kind of feels like we're getting penalized for other non-locals abusing and using our area, uh, which is kind of a tough pill for, for us to swallow. And my wife was quite concerned about that. Um, my thought was that the people that are traveling the fastest along there and that are cutting through it aren't the locals. So they're using our local streets just for them to cut through. Uh, my thought was if we could prevent them from getting there to start with, uh, and if we made at a certain point before Hatley, the chosen turn into a one way. Uh, so those, all those people in Royal Bay that were zipping down through there, all those people coming from Machosen will have to go up Latoria and then use uh, Memorial Parkway because that's essentially what Memorial Parkway was designed to do is to take all this traffic and get it out of town or back into town. Uh, so if we were to prevent all those people that are coming down our way, we would still have Machosen flowing both directions in front of Hatley and towards Suit. Uh, people that want to go along Machosen and back out to Machosen or Latoria can do so at the end of the at the end of the evening or after their work days, uh, and I don't see it as being as bad traffic in the post work hours in our area because they're going uphill and not as many people take that route. Uh, so I thought of channeling the traffic away from there in the morning uh, by making that change on Machosen might be might be something to consider, and I have no idea um, if that is something that you would consider or if it could be considered in your kind of pros and cons list, uh, but that's something that, uh, that I had uh, thought about, and I'd heard rumors of that uh, a year, a couple of years ago, and I don't know, it was just from another local, so I don't know if that was just hogwash or what it was. So um, yeah, so whatever the decision ends up being, I really hope that uh, the locals that aren't using and abusing it aren't the ones that get penalized for it, um, and I don't know if there could be a speed hump or two uh, put on to, you know, Aloha and Anchorage really seem to get zoomed down in the morning. So that might be a consideration as well. So okay. thanks for your time. Thank you. Was there anyone else? Judith Allen, uh, 3333 Anchorage. One thing I don't understand is why we can't have any police presence in the area to patrol. It doesn't make any sense to me that that area should be s just sort of the Wild West. So I'm wondering what can be done, what the city can do to get some police presence in the area. Thank you. Anyone else? No, okay, so I will bring it back to committee. See if Jason has a comment. Uh, just as an opening, uh, I was chair of transportation and public works from 2000 to 2009 and for three years on this council. This issue has been coming back again and again and again. It's time that council got off their fannies and did something about it. Um, there are basically two issues here. One, there's the increased volume from commuter traffic cutting through and two, traffic speeds. Um, the problem is really one of enforcement. The city has asked again and again for the RCMP to have an increased presence in enforcing speeding throughout Colwood. I have not seen any response to those requests ever. Uh, I guess the option would be for Colwood to have their own police force and uh, we would be able to tell them where to enforce and when. So given that we're unsuccessful in getting the RCMP to enforce speed, I find it highly unlikely they'll be there to enforce stop signs and no turn signs. So my suggestion is kind of a middle road, middle ground. I would suggest closing Ocean Boulevard in the middle from seven to nine and four to six. That would stop the commuter cut through entirely. Second issue is speeding and as staff report says, putting speed humps on uh, 
Milburn and all of the other streets is highly problematic due to the grade. Um, I think we should push that. You know, put them where they're needed and uh, people are going to slow down. Once they find out it's a hazard, they will slow down. The other thing is speeding along the lagoon itself, and that's always been a problem. Uh, we had at one point proposed, I believe, four speed humps along the lagoon and up past Fort Rod Hill. I think those are a good idea. Um, in the longer term, sea level rise and increasing storms will eventually wash out Ocean Boulevard. The only fix for that would be to raise the entire spit and armor the shoreline. Uh, costs would be astronomical. I don't see Colwood doing that. I think when nature takes its course, Ocean Boulevard is going to be closed as a through route. The final concern is doing this, if we move commuter traffic off of that route, uh, what's it going to do to uh, Machosan and Souk roads? There's bottleneck from Souk, uh, on Souk all the way from the rec center to the golf course or th the cemetery right now. Uh, putting more traffic on there is only going to make it worse. Really what we have to do is figure out a way to divert traffic onto VMP, which is what it was designed for in the first place put an idea out there, why don't we block Machosan Road at Latoria during the rush hour? Anyway, those are my thoughts. It's a very difficult uh, subject, but I really think the blocking the lagoon in the middle and speed humps wherever we can safely put them uh, as a trial measure. You know, if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it uh, offends too many people, uh, they can let us know at the election. We could put a plebiscite question on the, uh, the ballot saying, this is what we've done. Do you like it or not? And that way, Colwood residents would be able to weigh in. But to delay doing anything until after the next election, I don't think is an option. So I would urge council to consider any of the viable options in front of you and suggest acting upon them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A um, few good suggestions from the public tonight. Um, I, I really uh, did hear the, the comments with regard uh, to increasing the pedestrian safety. Um, and for those of you who sent me emails, thank you very much. I tried very hard to reply to you, but I've had no end of uh, internet difficulties uh, and have not been able to get anything to go or arrive, it seems, in the last couple of days. Um, but uh, certainly uh, addressing pedestrian safety for every neighborhood is, is important. And I've seen it not just in this neighborhood, but others um, that cars Increasingly, people are having suites and people are parking on the roadway, or maybe they just decide it's more convenient to park on the road. I have no idea. But when cars are parking um, loosely on the shoulders of the roads in areas where there's been no sidewalk uh, installed, um, and even in some places they're parking where a sidewalk has kind of been established uh, in front of Dunsmuir, uh, school is one, one example where people just pull up onto the, the curb and, and park, um, kind of straddling the curb in that area, leaving absolutely nowhere for pedestrians to go. There, there really is uh, some areas where cars should not park uh, for sight lines being, being a good reason, uh, speed bumps being another. I've seen a few um, good strategies used in other uh, municipalities, including large, heavy cement, either garbage containers or planter boxes being put in um, so that um, it's not possible uh, to go around um, a, a particular obstacle. Um, so th those are all things that we could work towards in a plan, but we really do need a plan. And one of my big problems with our planning so far 
is that we're looking at a map of this little area um, that's the neighborhood who's brought this forward, which I understand why, but the implications are much farther reaching, and I think we've all touched on that. One of my um, big concerns is Machosen Road, the intersection with Souk Road. Uh, if there's four cars that want to turn left to get over to VMP, um, nobody can turn right there. Four cars. That's how many it takes to block the intersection. So we need to do something about uh, having those two lanes at least uh, so that people can get onto that road. But the number one reason why uh, people are shortcutting uh, in the mornings particularly, uh, I would agree in the evenings people um, are less hurried. They're on their way home. They enjoy a, um, a beautiful... Well, they're not all less hurried, but many of them are less hurried uh, coming home, and they um, they do enjoy that drive, as do a lot of people with disabilities really enjoy if they can't get out and do things. They enjoy coming. A number of our seniors' bus tours come through Esquimalt Lagoon. It's quite um, a gem for so long as it lasts. I agree with Jason that we will not uh, likely uh, have it forever, but while we have it, um, I would hope that we could enjoy it. But I also think that uh, we've got to address the implications. Not that long ago, we did our transportation master plan and I was very disappointed that these types of issues were not what we talked about. Um, so, um, you know, I feel like we're wrestling with a really big issue with a lot le less resources than we've had uh, before to look at our road network. And that's what we're talking about. And this has been long before I was on Colwood Council. Uh, we were wrestling with Ocean Boulevard and whether or not it really was an evacuation route for Colwood. And I think the Emergency Planning Committee would have something to say about that too. So here's my suggestions. Uh, I like the idea that we create a one-way road for Hatley to stop that short short cutting. So from Milburn to or somewhere uh, where it makes sense to make that designation, uh, just make it so that you don't go downhill, you go uphill, and no more morning commute coming down from there. And then. Uh, in order to deal with the additional traffic on the lagoon, I think there are a lot more places on the lagoon that would accept speed bumps. Um, and so we would need to install speed humps on lagoon. I think that we would also need to slow traffic on Ocean Boulevard so that it isn't uh, a shortcut. Like right now, seriously, if you were trying to get downtown, it is way faster to go by the lagoon because you're missing all of the queued up traffic in front of Royal Roads University, all of the queued up traffic um, through Colwood Corners, and then, you know, you're back into the queue again. I mean, it's, it's where do you want to join the queue? <laughs> because uh, if you're going downtown, maybe you'll go through View Royal, it's a two-lane road. If you're going on the highway, it's a four-lane road. And that's all there is. And if you take uh, Latoria and VMP, you're getting in the queue even farther back on that four-lane road. So it's, it has to be less attractive as an option, and so it has to be slower. So I would recommend speed humps on the lagoon as well to not prevent people from going that way, but get them to be doing so in a, ma in a safe way. Uh, pedestrian safety on Milburn, uh, we need to eliminate some parking, uh, add the path, uh, as was suggested, and perhaps consider a four-way stop at Aloha. Uh, my experience in my neighborhood is the um, farther you are away from someone's destination, the more quickly they're willing to travel. So the people who live way at the end of the road will drive much quicker and then slow down progressively as they get closer to their destination. So longer roads, I think, will require more traffic calming. 
uh, for the cut through roads on, uh, um, I can't read them right now, but the other two roads that connect between Milburn and Lagoon, uh, they may also need speed bumps on them. Um, and I can point to one example, uh, the other end of Wishart Road here, another huge controversy before my time on council, speed bumps were petitioned for, it took a very long time to get them. They were installed because people were doing exactly the same thing, cutting through a residential neighborhood in order to beat traffic. And they've been very successful uh, because they're just um, difficult enough, slow you down enough that it, it's not any faster. And that's what drives people to do that. Uh, I think we should plan for um, doing something about the traffic on the chosen, uh, lengthening the right turn lane for now uh, would be one solution that would at least not see it get completely shut down uh, with traffic and plan for a light at Lagoon and Michosin because that will probably be required. Uh, even if we can get people to drive slower, we can't stop people um, from choosing uh, to use an automobile. Uh, hopefully transit will get better and other options will be out there, but right now that's not there. Um, so those are uh, all of the quick things that I could think of um, that I think are possible and certainly um, doable uh, in, in a re reasonable time frame to actually address the problem right now. And if we get it wrong, uh, we'll have to fix it. Um, it. It's, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I think we can <coughs> do something. Gordy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, my first observation is whatever we do on um, on one street, we're going to have to do on the next. So if we we plan on uh, some some improvement or some some uh, uh, deterrent on Lagoon, it has to happen on Melbourne. There's no doubt about it. And um, uh, the if anyone's familiar with the Tilikum Gorge area, you'll see um, Vincent Avenue, Walter Avenue. Um, they had the exact same issue that uh, the Lagoon neighborhood is currently experiencing and that people are funneling during those, uh, through those roads uh, and avoiding um, Obed onto Dysart, funneling further onto Cowper to get onto Admirals to make um, uh, and then run on to the, to the highway. And uh, what Saanich has done is actually installed small, and it was temporary at first, uh, and it's now permanent, more permanent, uh, a, a traffic circle, uh, a small one at an intersection, and then um, uh, further up, closer to Dysart, they installed uh, uh, speed humps. And uh, they've only done that on Vincent and Walter, and have encouraged traffic to funnel onto Obed, where it's more appropriate. Uh, for me, as a commuter, I used to use that route as a, as a bit of a, a cut through, and um, certainly it's, it's slowed me down. Um, I would, I, I take what the engineer has, uh, has to say about the speed humps uh, to heart, um, uh, and I, I, I'm cognizant uh, of the fact that there could be additional risk if we, uh, if we install speed cushions or speed humps at a significant grade, leaving us up, leaving us open to some, some liability. So uh, I appreciate that perspective. Um, I'd also uh, say that uh, I, I don't think we need to build everything all at once. It's something that we can do incrementally to see how, uh, how things work. So whether it's blocking Hatley and seeing what the uh, downstream effect is on uh, Milburn and, and uh, and Lagoon, and then moving from, from there to perhaps installing a traffic circle in strategic places on, uh, on uh, both Milburn and Lagoon, and seeing how that works, measure it, get some metrics, uh, and, then, uh, and then going from there. And, and I just will remind council and the public that years ago, we did install a, um, a stop sign, four-way stop at Anchorage and, uh, and Lagoon. Uh, because there was an issue 
uh, one block away at uh, uh, Ocean Boulevard and Lagoon where people were actually um, uh, blowing the stop sign. And um, so the intent uh, from the city from that perspective was at least to slow them down. Um, enforcement, I know it's a, we would love to have the RCMP or municipal enforcement uh, in every corner of the city, 24 hours a day, but it ain't realistic. And we can have some strategic enforcement, certainly, but then it gets predictable and it's a short-term fix. From my perspective, uh, an engineering fix is, uh, is more uh, what's needed here. Um, I'm personally, I, I understand the logic of, of uh, uh, blocking Ocean Boulevard during peak periods, but again, the downstream effect is huge. And uh, that, that is, like it or not, that is a major commuter route. And what we, we need to do is manage the traffic and the impact on the neighborhood by slowing it down, not, uh, not choking uh, other parts of the municipality. And, and Machosan Road and Souk Road would, uh, would, would back up even further. And I would suggest that if, if that was the direction, then uh, the city would want to make some more significant investment uh, in infrastructure along the Chosen Road uh, to make sure that pedestrians, cyclists, and, and drivers uh, are safe because the amenities right now and the infrastructure along that stretch of, uh, uh, of uh, Colwood Road is poor. Um, we've only started building sidewalks and lighting and stuff uh, in, in strategic areas. Um, I think with that, I will I will leave it. But uh, uh, again, I think uh, to start maybe small um, traffic circles in strategic areas uh, on the two major routes, and uh, and then I would not be opposed to uh, traffic uh, or speed cushions on Ocean Boulevard. Speed cushions are effective. They they have been installed in my neighborhood. And the nice thing about uh, speed cushions is that they can be moved. So if they they are bolted into the asphalt, so if they don't work in one area, you just unbolt them and move them, as opposed to the um, the speed humps on on uh, Wishart, which are um, they're permanent and not very flexible. So um, I, I agree with Jason, though. Um, either way, we need to make a decision uh, um, this year uh, soon uh, to start trying uh, to uh, to address some of the issues down in the lagoon. Carol, thank you. Nothing's easy, and we've been at this for uh, quite some time, as as Councillor Nalta said, uh, with it. But this is not the only area that suffers from speeding and rat running and whatever you want to call it, as they dipsy doodle. Um, and it's about finding the right kind of solution. So. Uh, as much as I don't like it, I think the quickest impact to the local area would be closing the middle of the Ocean Boulevard uh, for peak time, which would be the only only uh, part of it that I would look to agreeing with on a trial basis. And I don't know whether we can do some trial runs on on how we close it off. We've had the bridge closed before, but I don't know if anybody was actually studying the traffic change and flow and where did that traffic go. Um, not that I'm advocating more traffic studies, but it, we know there's a problem. There's a problem here. It's only going to increase. We've got development coming in off a of heather bell that's going to affect uh, all of this. Um, we've got problems on Carindale and Stornway and, and many other Fulton Road and Haida and all of those connectors that cross through as well. So I'm looking for solutions that we can... Uh, you know that wor are workable that we can move around and and identify as being actually constructive to changing things. Um, we need to definitely improve on our our regular road infrastructure, but these are costly enterprises and to undertake. And I don't know if any thought had been given through this, Nikki. In like what, what would be a combination of temporary measures that could be tried to see what the impact is before you go all out? Yes, absolutely. We could uh, see what we could do for temporary measures. So are you um, talking, sorry, through the chair, are you, are you talking um, about a temporary 
uh, closure of Ocean Boulevard? Well, even, I mean, I, I get it. The, the grades on most of the road preclude some of those airborne jumps that, that would, uh, you know, happen. But perhaps it's a four-way stop at this location and it's a speed cushion over, as uh, Councillor Logan said, you know, in, in an area that does work and making it different throughout that whole area so that there's no sort of real clear run in any direction. Uh, through the chair, our policy, our traffic common policy does indicate first um, installing a temporary measure, seeing how it works, and then afterwards installing permanent if it did work. Um, but we would definitely need direction as to which um, option um, we were trying to um, put in as a temporary measure because it will have different, it, it's going to have different costs associated with the temporary measure. So I, I can't answer um, the question insofar as costs of temporary measures until one is, is decided upon. So yes, we could do any of these measures temporarily, um, but I would have to know which one we were going to implement and then monitor. Because really what we're trying to do is change driver behavior. Rob? Thank you. Uh, so I live in the area, uh, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the issues there. Uh, first thing that obviously the council needs to make a decision on is are we attempting to slow down the traffic or are we trying to eliminate it? Um, and, it and if we're planning on rerouting this traffic to someplace else, where's that traffic going? And what studies have been done to say that that traffic now being pushed to somewhere else is not just going to create a different problem? And so we're not actually addressing the problem, we're just moving it. So uh, that would be my main concern around addressing the issue of closing uh, Ocean Boulevard down at any point at from four to six or to from seven to nine is where are those vehicles going um, between that? Because one, one of the things the residents mentioned uh, and I was talking to people in, in uh, Royal Bay and, and on Triangle Mountain and they have the same feelings as some people re uh, re uh, mentioned tonight about the fact that they like to, to take Ocean Boulevard home. It's their way to wind down as well. Um, and so it's not, it's not necessarily just addressing stopping it. I, I think we have to address how do we slow it down. And at least that's where I'm coming from with this. Uh, I've noticed on Ocean Boulevard that the traffic naturally slows down the busier it gets. You go down on a food truck Friday in the summer and right at that corner and that the traffic starts to back up and it just naturally slows down because there's a lot of people there. Um, you, you, you see the new artwork uh, and I've seen traffic naturally sort of slow down because it's a lot busier in that one little area of that. I'm not saying people don't still fly through it, but it, there's sort of that natural. And I think if we're able to encourage more and more use of Ocean Boulevard for recreational or for other reasons, that will have a natural tendency to slow down the traffic. Uh, to staff, have we ever looked at the option of a single light on Ocean Boulevard? And what I'm talking about is narrowing the road down from two lanes to one lane. And just like how you have a bridge where you have to stop, wait for the light to change halfway through, and then you rotate it, and then it's going to stop the traffic moving the other way. And then that way we still have the flow, but there's a natural slowdown right in the middle of, of, of Ocean Boulevard. Or are you just worried that that will just become an acceleration after they get past that? Uh, through the chair, we did look at um, how we could possibly have lights, as in stop, go. Um, the trouble is, is uh, well, there are a couple of, of troubles. One is um, Ocean Boulevard is very long, so where do you place it so that you can actually um, manage that queue? So um, it would be difficult to place along Ocean Boulevard um, a light that would be effective simply because the distance is so long. The other, the other issue I have, obviously, is um, uh, Lagoon and, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the other road. Help me. What's the, what's the pink road right now? Milburn. Milburn. Thank you. I just I went completely blank. And obviously, the issue is the steepness, right? And, that, and that's what we're dealing. And you can't, I mean, unfortunately, we can't regulate courtesy, right? And 
you know, if people are going to speed, they're going to speed. And how do we make them put the brakes on? That's really what it is. And how do we not make them hit their accelerator when they're going up? And that's the challenge that we have. And, and I guess I just have not heard a way that we do that effectively and efficiently yet. And I just don't know if there's another solution out there because I, I don't necessarily believe that speed humps are going to, or speed cushions are going to uh, be that effective. Um, I probably would have leaned towards more stop signs, but I hear what the staff are saying, that stop signs are unrealistic. Um, my concern is I just don't want to restrict this access to the rest of our community. Our rest of our community has every right to go down to the lagoon as well. Um, so how do we do that and still be respectful to this specific neighborhood? And that's, that's what I'm struggling with right now. Um, but I, I agree that we need to make a decision tonight. I, I don't think that this can go on. Uh, I just don't, I'm not at a place right now where I know w which decision that is. Anyone else from committee? Jason? As, as I said before, the one thing that does work is enforcement. When I was down in the Mayan Riviera in Mexico, uh, the main highway running north-south, every little town has what I would call a speed jump. If you hit that at the highway speed, you were airborne, and each one was manned by police officers with automatic rifles. <laughs> Nobody sped through those towns. The other one, a little closer to home, I, I'm fortunate enough to live in Belmont Park. All of Belmont Park is a 30-kilometer-an-hour speed zone, and the military police are there on a regular basis ticketing people. It works. All of these other things are things we do because we can't get the enforcement we want. So I would add a further list to my wish list, and that's once again, call would request that RCMP speed enforcement be stepped up. It is, we should communicate that this is a call would priority. And if they do not react on that, well, maybe we should start looking at uh, a different police force because I have never been happy with uh, the RCMP's cavalier attitude to the municipalities they serve. And another note, we just got a note that we're going to lose a bunch of officers for the G7 summit. Uh, we don't know how many, for how long, but they won't be in the, the Western communities. They'll be watching out for terrorists. We won't pay for it, but we will be short-staffed for that time. So that's another thing I really worried about with the RCMP. So I will turn this back to committee, and maybe we can make one recommendation at a time and uh, vote on them. Rob? Thank you. Sorry. I, I forgot. I have one more question just for staff before we move forward. Sure. Can you tell me, on Milburn and, and Lagoon, would it... it if, could we narrow the roads through sidewalks and not chicanes to, to, slow, those, to slow those roads down? And, I, and I'm thinking if we continue to narrow those roads, uh, that will force traffic to slow down. Have, have we looked at that, or is that just too cost prohibitive? Uh, through the chair, there are already sidewalks um, along Lagoon, mo most of Lagoon. Um, they're not, uh, you know, raised really high and... and um, placed narrowing the road, but there there are already sidewalks through most of Lagoon. Melbourne, on the other hand, does not have um, the sidewalk infrastructure at all. Uh, it's it's more of a rural feel down there. There are some swales, there are ditches, um, and so it is far more of a uh, rural feel along uh, Melbourne, uh, which is fitting as a local road. But there um, we. We can definitely look at um, what it would cost to put sidewalks um, along both of those roads in a in a manner, but that that isn't necessarily going to stop the speed of traffic. It may ma make people feel a bit safer, absolutely, but it's not going to stop speed or cut through at all. So, so excuse me, through the chair. So narrowing the roads, there there isn't research that shows narrowing the roads will actually reduce mm -hmm. speed. Narrowing the roads will reduce speed. Um, one way to narrow roads that's very effective in Vancouver is to allow parking on them, which is not ideal because people need to get in and out of their driveways. But uh, 
it's very difficult um, to maneuver through side streets in, in Vancouver, for example, because everybody is parked next to a curb, which forces them to park onto the road surface itself. And it does throttle back that. And people just simply have to wait to be able to go through those, those roads. So that is effective. Cynthia. Thank you. So in an effort to um, move forward with some measures that I think we could undertake, there are a number of areas listed um, on uh, where, where we have the slopes uh, delineated. And as I understood from the report, 8% is considered uh, too great uh, a grade to put a speed bump on. But there are a number of areas that are less than that, um, speaking specifically to Melbourne, from Anchorage to Aloha is 7.5%, and from Hawkering to Hatley is 7.3%. So those are both under the threshold uh, where uh, it would be safe to put uh, temporary speed humps in. So, um, and there are also similar, actually a lot more options on Lagoon Road. Uh, but I'd like to try to um, ensure that where there's some parity between the two roads. So where we slow the traffic on this road, they don't just deke over to the other road to avoid the, the speed bumps. So where we put speed bumps in on Milburn, I'm suggesting that we also put speed humps in on Lagoon so that we match them uh, so that there isn't an ability to jump over to the other. Uh, so maybe the director of engineering can help me where she thinks they uh, might be uh, better. I don't think down right at the bottom is as much of a problem on Milburn. I think the problems are... Um, where the slopes are steeper and it's further up the hill. Uh, I'm sure there are problems at the bottom too, but um, for the, the purposes of our, um, our, our plan, to st which I believe the plan from what I'm hearing around the table is to slow people down. That's certainly my intention is to get people to slow down. Yes, they can still take this route, but um, if they do take this route, it's going to be the scenic route, <laughs> the scenic pedestrian friendly route. Uh, so we could put it in um, Anchorage to Aloha and Hawkering to Hatley. Uh, now, the only question is whether that should be two in each location or one in each location. So between Hawkering and Hatley, that brings us right up to that really problematic corner that we've been talking about uh, going up Hatley Drive. So in my estimation, I think maybe there needs to be two. Otherwise, people only slow down for the speed bump and then keep going. And then, sorry, I'm having to flip back and forth to uh, make sure I get it right. Um, from Anchorage to Aloha is the next location. So that um, is an area where uh, it w I think two would also be appropriate. So there would be two speed bumps in a one block space, two speed humps, and that would cause people to slow down significantly and then do the same on the um, other side of the road. So I think it would be between Hawkering and Aloha on Lagoon and uh, between Aloha and Anchorage on Lagoon. So with targeting 
all of that would be uh, kind of four blocks that are significantly slowed down with two speed bumps in each block uh, and two blocks on each road. So there would be four blocks. So that would be eight speed humps in total. They would be movable. And um, that's what I would like to recommend. So that means that you can't jump from one road to the other road. It, it may, uh, in my opinion, uh, require um, consideration of speed humps in the future on either Aloha or Anchorage if those roads become issues. Uh, but I think for a start, it would be, uh, it is targeting uh, those areas of the neighborhood who have come forward and asked for some help with something that if it doesn't work, we could change it um, or move them slightly. I know in areas where I've seen speed bumps go in, there's been considerable debate uh, about whose driveway they're in front of and you know what parking spot they're impacting. I know that all of that will still be some detail work to be um, uh, worked on, uh, but I think because they are mobile, because we, we have an opportunity to try something and get it, see if we can get it right. So that would be my recommendation. Gordy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, I can support that. I was kind of thinking uh, th possibly looking at a, um, a temporary traffic circle uh, kind of on the upper portion and then some sort of uh, speed hump on the, on, the, on the lower portion. It's clear that there has to be something on both portions, uh, but of course uh, with the proviso that there has to be uh, uh, some care given to uh, the impacts of the fire department and, and transit as well. Um, uh, we will get. I, I would probably suggest that we uh, that we uh, we phase in uh, the installation of the uh, speed cushions just to see how they are doing. You know, like we we may only need two on each road if that's uh, and if it works, fantastic. Uh, if if we need to have another one or move them, then then we can. We will we will get complaints. Uh, because I get them from the Sunridge Valley uh, residents of the thump thump, thump thump, thump thump. They do work, and you will get some idiot that will fly over it anyways, but for the most part, uh, they are effective, but you will get the thump thump, and we will hear about it. Uh, but, uh, but I think if we don't try it, then, uh, then uh, we won't know their effectiveness. So, uh, and they are, they cost money, but... Uh, but uh, overall, I think probably um, somewhat inexpensive, and we can reuse them uh, as well if uh, if they don't work out. And we look for another solution. So, Jason. Yeah, I can support that, but uh, I will point out that the staff report says that excessive speeding is not the problem on Melbourne. Uh, it doesn't meet the uh, city criteria for ex excessive speeding, so. Whether that's going to fix anything on Melbourne, I think the problem with Melbourne is it just gets too much volume for, th for the way the road is. Uh, this suggestion, I don't think will do anything for the volume going down Melbourne. And so I would suggest maybe that um, staff look at making Hatley, part of Hatley one way uh, as well. Whichever would be the appropriate part, I can't guess at this point, but. Uh, if we do that, then at least we limit the commuter traffic in one direction, a.m. or p.m. And the other thing that hasn't been addressed is the drag strip that uh, the spit has become. Um, I would like to see probably four speed hump, speed cushions, whatever we want to call them, be installed along the length of uh, Ocean Boulevard on the spit because uh, I can hear the cars roaring down there from my house that all hours of the night and motorcycles as well. So it has become a drag strip. Uh, 
probably a temporary one because I'm sure that road's going to be flooded within the next 10 years. So uh, maybe we could vote on Councillor uh, Day's suggestion and then I will make a second motion. Any other discussion? Rob? Thank you. Uh, actually, so I never even thought of this until Gordy just brought it up. So how do we address that issue? Because I, I can imagine there are going to be people on both Lagoon and Melbourne in two months going, I'm going crazy because I'm hearing, as one resident said, 300 cars an hour going thud, 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 thud over in front of their house and going, I can't deal with this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that's, so I, I don't want to have one fix just to have 10 neighbors super upset in two months because there's a huge amount of noise being created by all this thud, thud noise. Um, and, you know, I would actually look to the audience as well. Between now and council, please reach out to council as well to tell us if you'd be comfortable having a speed bump in front of your house, recognizing that it goes thud, 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 thud. And if it does, then that's fantastic. And if you go, oh my goodness, I don't want that, then we need to hear that as well. Because that's gonna, that's gonna be the, probably a determining factor between now and council. Sure, just uh, using the mic. One thing has happened in, I work in Sydney during the day, and, and in Sydney, they've got a 30 kilometer for basically all Sydney down, you know, the residential area of Sydney. And that might be an option. Basically, you put a 30 uh, kilometer speed limit all over the municipality, except for the main road, Soup Road, and the Chosen Road, which you might make it up to 50, or but it's still 30. But make it 30 in all residential areas. So thus, if you're going, you're speeding. Doesn't matter where you're speeding. It's easy for an officer to pull you over and give you a ticket. Because I say that is the speed limit in in downtown, in Sydney, the whole residential area. It's 30 kilometers. So that might be an option that you could use for the whole municipality. Thank you. Anyone else on committee? Staff? Uh, Madam Chair, I just uh, would like to remind uh, committee that the policy does require that we pull the neighborhood. So the issue around the speed bumps will we'll come back to council once we get some direction on um, what the preferred approach is. So tonight was really for us to get some feedback on um, what do we do about Ocean Boulevard? And what's your preferred approach for Lagoon and Milburn? And I'm having a hard time reading this Hatley, uh, which I think we've heard, but um, we still do need to do the, pol the uh, neighborhood polling. And that's where we'll find out who has a tolerance for, or an intolerance for speed bumps. Um, and we may not, we may not actually know until they start hearing it, as you say. But I just wanted to remind the uh, committee that there is a process still. But given the data that we had reviewed, we realized we had a complex issue on our hands, and that's why we wanted to bring it back to the committee for uh, for some discussion and some guidance. And I think we've got we've got that with the motions. Um, and I just, I just want to caution you not to get into too much of the detail of trying to interpret engineering standards. We know you want to put speed bumps on. We know you want to potentially consider some four-way stops. We can come back to council and report on where we should put the four-way stops, where we should put the speed bumps. And, uh, and we'll proceed with doing the uh, survey of the neighborhood. And uh, so just before we move on, I just wanted to say a couple things. So regarding Ocean Boulevard, um, so my, what I've heard tonight is safety is the primary concern. And um, I think speeding is the first thing that we should look at solving. So with the uh, Ocean Boulevard, I would be in favor of trying a trial period of closing during peak hours. If this is something that council wants to consider, I would um, suggest looking at the summer hours I know that's um, not the regular business months, but it would be a good time to do a small trial. And um, I also think whatever decision we make tonight that uh, council 
should look at starting to monitor other roads such as Mitrosin um, and seeing what the effects are. If we go with speed bumps on both Milburn and Lagoon, I think people would definitely start taking Mitrosin. Um, another thing is I think, I think we should consider closing down roads. I think that's a, will be a very effective way to solve the speeding. So I would be in favor of putting speed bumps on Lagoon and considering closing Hatley. I think that's a, that's a good start. Um, so yeah, we have a motion on the table. So any other, Rob? So thank you, with the motion that is on the table then, do we need to become more general? Do we need to, like, is that, 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 the motion that we have right now is quite specific about where we were talking about it. Does staff, does staff prefer that we generalize? Uh, through the chair, I, no, I think, uh, I think the motion that, that's on the floor right now is, um, it's cl very clear to us that we want speed bumps uh, placed in an effective manner to control the speeds on Lagoon and Melbourne, and if, and if we, we'll report back if there's anything that's outside the norm of engineering standards or of why we've located them where we have, but I think for the purposes of this discussion, uh, we've got good direction. I'm just gonna ask that staff repeat the motion just so there's no confusion, please. That it be recommended that two speed cushions be placed on Anchorage to Aloha and Hockering to Hatley and that two speed cushions be placed on Aloha and Anchorage on Lagoon and Hockering and Aloha on Lagoon. Thank you, does that sound correct? Okay, so that being said, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, okay, so that motion is carried. Okay, Jason? Like to uh, direct staff to investigate uh, closing off Hatley or at least making it a one-way <coughs> street uh, for all or part of it uh, on a temporary basis to see if that uh, has any effect on the commuter traffic. Okay, um, so calling that, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, so that also passes. And finally, I would like to suggest that um, we investigate putting four speed humps along the length of uh, Ocean Boulevard on the spit. Okay, any questions? No? So call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? One opposed. Okay. So with that, I think we'll move on to the second 4.2. So that's a report from the Manager of Building Inspections and Bylaw Services regarding a staff review of the Urban Forest Task Force recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Staff have, review, uh, have completed a review of the Urban Forest Task Force recommendations that were provided to Council on the 9th of April, and they have identified areas that required further discussion, and staff have provided their comments for consideration. Before moving forward with preparing a new draft Urban Forest Bylaw, staff want to ensure that they are at a clear understanding and direction on the proposed recommendations. Ta-da! 
Okay. So before bringing it back to committee, I would like to open it up to the public. Any comments or questions? Good evening. Um, so I'm actually doing two pieces. Um, the chair of the task force, Rick Jeffries, who you all heard from um, when he did the presentation to council. Unfortunately, he's in Vancouver tonight, so he wasn't able to be here. Um, he did send an email to the mayor, um, and so I know that she'll share that with the rest of you, but I did just want to kind of read it out so that everybody has a chance to, to hear what he said. Um, so he says, I read the staff report going to Committee of the Whole. Um, I'm disappointed on several fronts, the least of which is the abandonment of some principles the committee and citizens felt were important. Affordability, simplicity, and balance between public and private rights. Um, he mentions a few specifics. Um, one is by changing the definition of a protected tree to 30 centimeters DBH down from 60, it does mean many more permits will need to be issued, um, which is, um, Rick suggests, is a much greater burden on the taxpayer and on city resources. Second one he addresses is the need for an urban forest management plan. The staff report addresses what's already covered in OCP policies, um, but Rick is saying that's insufficient and notes that the foresters and arborists on the committee really thought that doing an urban forest management plan was common sense. Um, and he suggests that we should, uh, you should think about reappointing the committee to make recommendations on what an urban forest management plan looks like and how it could be resourced. Security deposits. Um, feels that they are completely unnecessary. Um, it ties up people's money. It creates paperwork and banking for the city and doesn't serve a purpose. He says, we want people to plant trees and not treat them like criminals. Every person we talked with was against those deposits. Finally, he says that asking residents to submit a plan that's equivalent to an EDPA permit to cut more than one tree down is a cost and time burden unwarranted by the value that it may add. So he says, thank you for your considerations, for your comments, and have fun tonight. So that was from Rick. Um, and I also, as a member of the, the committee, that task force, um, wanted to make some, some comments as well. So I'm going to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to, to serve on the task force. It was a really good group of people. Uh, we had a real variety of expertise. Uh, we had a real variety of viewpoints. And we spent a lot of time. We spent more than two hours every week over a period of three months. And we discussed, and we debated, and we deliberated, and we all learned from each other, and from the staff who were present through that process, and from the public who made presentations to us. So we had some really strong reasons set out in the principles that we put forward in that report for recommending the way that we did it was all very well thought through. So it's disappointing to see some of those recommendations perhaps going in a different direction. So there's a lot of detail I could get into, but there are really kind of three points that I wanted to get across. So I want you to look at the task force report in its entirety, not just the report that's in front of you tonight from staff. Carrots are better than sticks and beware of unintended consequences. So just a little bit more detail on those three. Um, first off is, is that you had the presentation from, from Rick at your council meeting. Um, there was a, a very light amount of discussion that evening, but you hadn't really had a chance to deliberate amongst yourselves about the entire content of the task force report. So you have the staff report in front of you. Um, it's silent on a number of the recommendations that the task force made. I'm assuming, but not clear, that that means that the staff is um, supporting the rest of the recommendations that were made by the, the task force. Um, so I just kind of want to encourage you to really look at that entire picture. Second point I wanted to make is carrots are better than sticks. 
Um, collectively, that task force brought a lot of experience from multiple municipalities um, around this region, but not just around this region. Um, and one of the things that we noticed was the, the power of incentives rather than the stick. Um, Saanich, we noted, if you want to do the replacement tree thing, they'll give you a replacement tree. Um, and we looked at um, ways of doing that, something similar in Colwood. The staff report recommends tying the incentive to the urban forest management plan, but then notes that that management plan may not happen for quite some time. So I would argue that you have said that managing the urban forest is an important thing to do, that you've begun this process, and that you need to make sure that it's properly resourced. So I would hope you would consider adding a recommendation at the end of your recommendations this evening to at very least put funding for an urban forest management plan into your five-year financial plan. Um, at least start to nail down when that's going to happen or in some way use the, the, the income, so to speak, from tree permits to create some form of incentives for tree planting. So find a way to get there sooner. Beware of unintended consequences, and I want to give um, a couple of examples. And I also want to note that sort of one of those things hanging out at the back of everybody's mind was the experience that Saanich had with its EDPA. They put out a, a bylaw that was on the face of it, reasonable. How it was implemented felt unreasonable to a lot of people. There was a huge backlash, and it's now no longer there. I would encourage you to think of making sure that you have an urban forest bylaw that is seen as reasonable, that people feel comfortable with, and you won't get the backlash. So, a couple of examples. Staff recommendation um, talks about making the removal of more than one tree very hard and quite onerous to do and it will cover many more trees by coming down to a 30 centimeter DBH for um, those additional species. One of the things that we noted as part of the Urban Forest Task Force is that Colwood has been the municipality that has not had a bylaw ever, and yet we are still a very well-treed community. Where we're losing trees, is where development happens. We move trees to make places for homes, to make places for new people. And where you're having that tree loss during land development, it's being done under a development permit process or some kind of development process. So it's kind of outside of this bylaw anyway. If people want to remove trees, they will find a way to get around it. This is kind of going back to your comment about cars and all the different ways they move. So. And this is not an unrealistic example. This is stuff that has happened in other municipalities. Let's say I've got a Douglas fir, and it's getting bigger. And I know that it's going to be hard to cut that tree down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chainsaw, and I'm going to cut that tree when it gets to 29 centimeters, before it gets to be part of your permit process. People in other municipalities have found this is an issue. It's the kind of, so instead of kind of letting my tree get bigger, but I know it's okay because I know it's going to be a reasonable process to take that tree down. Now I'm taking the tree down sooner because we've got people removing smaller trees. Unintended consequence possibly number two. Replacement trees and the security. The task force recommended that um, there was a possibility of replacement trees either on site or on city land. In other words, I take a tree down um, I can choose to put my replacement tree on my own property, or if I decide that for whatever reason that's it's completely inappropriate, um, that tree is sitting on top of my septic tank and I really don't want it there, um, then I can choose to pay, um, in our case, the, the suggested price was $250. I can pay the city that amount of money and the city will plant a tree of its own choosing on its own property. And there was no security for less than five trees. But, going with the staff recommendation, if I plan to remove three trees, instead of replacing them on site, I now have an incentive just to pay the city that kind of $250 trees to make it go away. Because otherwise, I'm paying three times that security. And there was a, a talk in the report about bringing that security level down, but it doesn't actually mention to what. But let's just throw out, for example, it's $1,000 a tree. 
That's all of a sudden $3,000 I got to pick out of my pocket. Instead of $750 to make it go away, the city gets to plant the tree, and and I get to, you know, either I get to plant a tree on my property or not, depending on what I want, a nice shrub. Um, so unintended consequence, it could discourage people from planting on their own property. So please respect that kind of holistic thinking that the task force did. Focus on incentives. Be careful of unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Philip Nurse again from Royal College, and just to echo the point, um, if I didn't come across the first time, I understand why the city, um, the staff in the city brought forward this bylaw. We appreciate the bylaw and I respect it, and I think I agree with it. I think it needs to. I live in Sandage, and I understand that process from there. It's just about how it remarks on certain businesses at the end of the day, which I think has been not really fully considered as a whole. So I just need to emphasize that. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Um, it is kind of misdirected. Uh, the recommendation is that where there is a tree management plan in place, that will govern the rules for tree management. So if the golf course has a tree management plan and it has been accepted by the city, that's the plan you work under. You don't work under the bylaw. Well, certainly that was the um, committee's uh, intent, is that if, if you have a tree management plan in place for your entire property that was accepted by the city, that would govern what you do, not the get a permit for every single tree, put a deposit down, replace that X ratio. Uh, the one-to-one -one or two-to-one or ten-to-one ratio is, is entirely arbitrary and depends on, on what you're doing. Um, Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I hate to um, interrupt you, but you need to use the microphone. Okay. No, no, you, you, yeah. you just have to use yeah. the mic just because we'll get recorded for later. Sorry, once again, what I was saying is that when I read the report that was presented to the council meeting at last, um, the last whole meeting from the report, there was nothing on there on that. And when I was at the Urban Task Force and recommendations about the forest management plan, forest vegetation plan and what came forward, I was just a little shocked that it seemed to be silent there all of a sudden. And then Mr. Jeffrey said to me, well, Philip, you guys work it out with the city of Colwood, with RCUC, and hope everything will work itself out sort of thing. So I was a little vague on that a little bit, and I said that to both staff members when I met, of what that meant at the end of the day, because there was nothing really there substantial for me. Thank you. And the problem here is we don't have a draft bylaw in front of us, so I really no way to comment on that at this point. Fair enough. So that was entirely the committee's intent, and I will continue to follow that up uh, because I think, yeah, a, a property or size is a completely different kettle of fish from the average homeowner or even the average development permit area. Thank you. I appreciate it. Did staff have anything to add on that? So the... Um the tree management plan for um, regardless of the, the size of that lot, um, the bylaw would still be in effect. There was no recommendation to actually separate that out. And that is exactly not what the committee was recommending. So uh, when the bylaw comes forward, I will be axing that portion of it uh, or moving to act that or maybe I can ask committee to give that direction right now is that the committee's uh, 
The task force's suggestion was that where a, an accepted tree management plan is in place, that governs the tree management, not the city bylaw. And again, that is what I think Royal Callwood was asking for. They're a special case, so I don't think we have anybody else with that many trees on their property, at least not anymore. So is that a recommendation? Yes, I would move that uh, staff be directed to include the uh, recommendation from the Urban Task Force uh, Committee that where there is a tree management plan in place, this will govern the rules uh, for tree management and not the other rules under this bylaw. Okay, and we'll and we could make that where there is a tree management plan that has been accepted by the city in place. Madam Chair, if I could respond to that, the uh, just to back up a little bit, and we've had this discussion with the task force when we were working through this, the tree bylaw, as most bylaws, is a blunt instrument. And um, Royal Callwood certainly has a unique situation, which we recognize. But um, this, we have tried to, the staff recommendation in this report is, tr is keeping in mind that this will ultimately be a bylaw and secondly, to Judith's point, the care we are taking is that no matter who is responsible for the care and feeding of this bylaw, it will not leave itself open to a lot of interpretation or a particular bias. So that's part of what's underneath the staff recommendation. To Councillor Nault's uh, point about the tree management plan, the difficulty that staff will have is that there would have to be some mechanism that recognizes that tree management plan from the part of the city. So we'll have to come back potentially to committee with some recommendations around how that could be accommodated. Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you, uh, so discussion on the motion. Uh, I guess uh, I'm cons I, I concur uh, completely, Councillor Nault, but I guess I'm confused in that I've heard uh, Judith not only stand up and speak uh, about her concerns that were missed in, in the report, but also Rick Jeffries. And it seems as though the, the sorry, I want to call it commission, but it wasn't a commission, whatever, a, a task force. The task force recommendations are different than what staff recommendations are. And I'm wondering if staff during the presentation or now can tell us why there are there are differences between what the task force recommended and what you, you're bringing to us this evening because I, I don't know the rationale of why you guys are choosing one and not the other. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the, the reason that staff on a number of cases uh, in this report are recommending something different than the committee is back to my, what I was mentioning previously is that we are looking at this through the lens of crafting a bylaw. Um, there are some recommendations that the committee made that are uh, perfectly acceptable and probably are best suited as a policy, but our task and the terms of reference were to review the urban tree bylaw. And as I said, that, that uh, imposes some real constraints on how much latitude we have so that, that is um, why the staff recommendations in some cases differ from the committee recommendations. Uh, so uh, as a follow-up, can you please, uh, we, we've been talking about Royal Callwood. Um, what about OV, uh, Olympic View? Are they in the same position with the trees that they have on their property? Uh, Excluding the development area. I'm talking about the golfing area right now. Uh, my understanding is most of the Olympic view is covered with a development permit area, so it would not be subject to the same conditions. Gordy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just getting back to your point, Dennis, uh, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's, from what I'm hearing, it's difficult to put all the recommendations from the task force into a bylaw because of the structure uh, and the legislative framework that a that uh, is necessary to write a bylaw, right? Uh, so that's why it's a little more blunt. However, uh, there could be some policies 
drafted that would um, kind of carry out what the uh, task task force is uh, is recommending? I, I guess I'm just looking for because council was pretty supportive, and I'm just trying to understand the process. Uh, so uh, there, council was really supportive of the recommendations, and so I think what we're trying to rationalize is how do we given the limitations of a bylaw, uh, support the, re the recommendations for the most part that the uh, task force is recommending. I'm just Great. trying to understand I'm just, the difference. I think um, we need to focus back on the motion. Okay. We just, yeah. Um, let's deal with the motion okay. and then we'll get back yeah, to your that's point. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah. so uh, we have a motion on the floor. Could we have the motion read back, please? Looking to staff or that staff be directed to include in the urban force task that where an accepted tree management plan is in place that governs and not the city bylaw. Uh, accepted by the city, I want to make okay, I'll that take clear. Accepted by the city. And, and, and I would just want to comment on that. We've already created two classes of, of properties uh, by having environmental development permit areas have their own set of rules. So uh, having another set for the Royal Colwood doesn't seem to be uh, too big a stretch to me. It's, it's the logical thing to do. Um, and it's a one-off. Not many property owners are going to uh, go out and hire arborists and foresters and land managers to prepare a tree management plan. It's way beyond their, well, they're not going to pay that much money. They're just going to follow the bylaw. <laughs> but this, I've had a fundamental problem with this bylaw from day one in that we're treating the resident, general residents of Colwood one way and we're treating the ones that happen to be, have the misfortune to be in an environmental development permit area another way altogether. And I really fundamentally disagree with that, and I would love to see that addressed when we change the OCP. Uh, that would be the appropriate place for that. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? Sorry. Rob? So, uh, well, sorry, I'm just, I don't, un I agree with Jason, but I don't know how valid this is after hearing what staff is saying. Staff are saying they're trying to build a bylaw that, that can incorporate this, but I think it needs to be incorporated, or how, how does, how does it remain not silent? Yeah, yeah, and uh, I knew that's where Gordy was going, yeah. but that's I, that's why I have a hard time figuring out how to vote on this. Yeah. If, if I may, I may press council. Isn't there a way? To I'm actually going to let staff right, speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd, I'd just like to uh, reiterate uh, an earlier point that um, if count if the committee would like to recommend that this be initiated as a change to the bylaw. Uh, staff could be directed to look at how that could be incorporated either through bylaw or policy. So uh, in terms of how this is implemented, can staff can help uh, counsel with that. So um, in terms of how this is um, implemented, we can, we can assist with recommendations to do it legally and within the context of uh, either city policy or, or bylaw. Carol? So does that mean changing the motion perhaps to refer back to staff to determine what that policy and and or or bylaw change would be I think that would be appropriate but my point would be that the policy and the bylaw have to be adopted at the same time or it's a totally meaningless policy Man madam chair I, um, I think what councillor Nalt's proposing actually could be incorporated into the bylaw it's not unlike today uh, the bylaw states, and I'm paraphrasing probably very poorly, that uh, it doesn't apply in areas where there is environmental development permit areas. We could equally state that uh, uh, through the bylaw in uh, areas such as Royal Colwood, where there is an established urban forest, that they're required to do a tree management plan, and, in the, and uh, the tree management plan dictates how, when, and under what conditions those trees are pruned or removed. Uh, so I don't, I don't see it as being 
I think it's a doable amendment to the bylaw is what I'm trying to say, and we can work on that. Okay, so we're happy with what's on the floor? Okay, so I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None? Okay, so that carries. And um, uh, now further on that, I would have to say that the um, staff recommendation on uh, changes to protected trees, I agree with, as I pointed out at the uh, meeting where we discussed this with my little calipers, that a 60 centimeter tree at DBH is a very, very big tree indeed. And the number of trees that would be protected under the bylaw if we ex exempt anything up to 60 centimeters, as I said, there's <coughs> something like 50 trees in my yard, only two of them would meet that criteria. And a lot of those are close to 100 years old. So. Uh, I do agree with the staff recommendation of, of 30 centimeters for those specific trees. Uh, the recommended security deposits, I totally disagree with. It's onerous, it's uh, punitive, and um, if we do bring forth a security deposit, I suggest that the deposit be no higher than the cost of the replacement tree would be. So we, we, I think the committee was recommending trees be a replacement tree be a two meters planting. Uh, so if, if we could investigate what the cost of a two meter tree is, it's not a thousand dollars a tree. I can guarantee that. Uh, so I'm really thinking that the uh, task force recommendation of no security deposit for one to five trees is is the way to go. So I will be. I will make the motion that uh, that recommendation stand and be incorporated into the new bylaw that for one to five trees, there be no security deposit required. Committee, Cynthia. I uh, completely support that. Um, in fact, the, the, the whole bylaw, given that I've got to be the the original tree hugger. That's probably why I ran for council in the, in the first place. Was thought it was better than chaining myself to the trees, um, and, and that's the truth. That's that's not a made up story. Uh, I have lots of trees, and uh, I love them, and I care for them. And sometimes I have the wrong tree in the wrong place, and I just feel that this bylaw is very heavy-handed. It is not the residents who have created the problem. It is development that's created the problem in Colwood with our lack of, of tree cover. Um, and so I wholeheartedly support there not being deposits because right now there's a whole lot more sticks than carrots. Um, there's a lot more, uh, you know, regulation. I, I just it, it completely uh, bothers me um, that I can plant, I can't tell you how many trees I've planted, but I've planted a lot of trees, and some of them have had to, to go. I've planted certainly more than I've ever taken down, but um, to have the city come and tell me what I can do in my own backyard with the trees that I planted there myself uh, is really pushing it. Um, it is unpalatable in the extreme. Um, you know, I, I feel like you should tell me what color I should have in the bedroom. Uh, it's that personal for me. Um, and where we've lost our trees is where development has occurred. The Bennett property, the most intact, complete, second growth forest in all of South Colwood is been replaced by rock walls and houses built on the top of fortified embattlements. Uh, that is where our trees went. So um, absolutely make it easy for people to plant their trees and for people to keep their trees and having uh, expensive reports um, for what's on your own property that you may have planted there yourself foolishly <laughs> at some point in time, sometimes, um, is definitely, um, it, it completely 
flies in the face of what I think we should be doing with an urban forest task force. That said, I'm still very supportive of having uh, an urban forest plan. Um, so I absolutely support uh, us not having deposits wherever possible. Anyone else? Carol? Any appetite to lower that to one to four trees? Because I think any residential property owner would be hard pressed to find five trees. We, so we did have a recommendation on the floor uh, to lower the security deposit to none and to have the staff recommendation of 30 centimeters. Is that correct? Douglas Fur and a few others. And I know the um, task force doesn't agree with me on that, but when you count how many trees on urban properties are 60 centimeters and above, it's precious few. Cynthia? <laughs> Sorry, I hadn't thought about the second part of the motion. Um, and there is one species that's named in, in the report, and that's the Grand Fur. Um, which, uh, find its reference, I did circle it. Oh, it's under protected tree and in, uh, after Douglas fir is named grand fir. Um, the grand fir is the only tree on my property that I've had uh, major problems with uh, due to spontaneous death. They're a very fast grower. I went to the forest um, education center to find out about them. Uh, and I said, oh, I had this tree, it just suddenly died. She said, oh, did it look like this? And I said, yeah. She said, oh, it was a grand fir. They do it all the time. So they are a very dangerous tree. Uh, they're fast growing and quick dying uh, from all of the professional advice I was given on them. And I'm concerned about them being becoming a problem, one of those unintended consequences uh, by protecting a tree that <coughs> is quite possibly um, a hazard in its later life. Gordy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. May I suggest that uh, we separate the issue of the permitting and the, um, the uh, diameter of the tree? Because for, for me, I'm not sure if they're related, but... Uh, if I may, the diameter is in a critical part of, of what tree is protected or what is not. If, if the tree is not protected, you don't need a permit. You can cut it down any time you want. Uh, if the tree is protected, and with, to Councillor Day, I would point out that if she did have a grand fur that was in the way or showing illnesses or Dead. thinking of being dangerous, uh, it just means she would need a permit to cut it down. And that I, I don't have a problem with that. It's just to prevent people wandering in and cutting down any tree they, they want that happens to be uh, 38 centimeters. So it, it's not saying a tree can't be cut down. And, and the same with uh, Arbutus, Gary Oak, Dogwood, and you. So you can get a permit to cut them down. They are just protected, so you do need the permit. I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I take the point that was made tonight is uh, the unintended consequence and the amount of administrative uh, work that is going to have to be undertaken by staff and, uh, and, and the cost of the rest of the taxpayer. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm sensitive to that. It may not be an issue. We may not get any permits. I don't know. But, uh, but you know, I, I think to keep it simple uh, for staff um, and less of a burden, I don't know. I don't know where uh, 30 centimeters versus 60 centimeters come from. Uh, I have I haven't heard a rationale for for a specific size on either side. To be honest with you, so I, I couldn't even give you an educated uh, opinion on, on the Ma difference it makes. Madam Chair, if, if I could just um, uh, provide some context here. In the experience of staff. Um, most of the applications we get to remove trees are regarding hazardous trees. Uh, I am not aware of any applications we've had 
where they uh, have asked to remove a tree that's not hazardous. And as the task force committee members pointed out quite rightly, most residents of Colwood are loath to remove the trees unless they're hazardous and they have to go. So in some respects, I would suggest that the provisions in this bylaw regarding removal of protected trees, with the notable exception of the Colwood Golf Course, probably will not come up very often. Thank you. Um, okay, so that being said, are you willing to separate? How, how would the committee's feeling? Do we want to separate? I don't see how you can separate uh, a DBH from def a definition of a protected tree. I just mean if, this if you have no yeah. size, yeah. it's it's yeah. any tree you want. Like you're going to need to get a permit to cut down a tree that's that big around, if it's not defined. So the idea of the, the, the size definition was to exclude trees that are not mature or big or important to the canopy. Gotcha, Madam Chair. Can we just get some clarification? I, I think. Staff believe that this, the request to separate out the issues is between the security deposit and the max and the minimum DBH, not the permitting. So it's just, um, I think that could be separated out. Right. Council mm -hmm. Nolts correct. You can't separate out the permitting from a mm -hmm. protected tree, and if you're defining a protected tree of anything over 30 centimeters, it needs a permit. I think what the committee's desire is to separate the security deposit issue from the DBH. Yep, that's what I was trying to say. So yes, the recommendation was for zero to five trees, no security deposit be required. And that the staff recommendation of changing the protected tree, uh, as in the report uh, under protected tree B, uh, trees having DBH of 30 centimeters or more being Douglas fir, grand fir, big leaf maple, and western red cedar will be 30 centimeters. Any other tree in the city is a 60 centimeter. So if you've got a, an alder tree that's 60 centimeters across or 58 centimeters across, heaven help you, uh, you won't need a permit. But it's just to protect trees that are perform uh, important, native trees that form an important part of our tree canopy. Sorry, I'm confused. So, are is that separated? Are you letting us separate it? Or <laughs> <laughs> As I said, you can't separate a tree size from the definition of a protected tree because without a size, every tree is going to be protected. So, I think what we would like to first vote on is the security deposit for the one to five trees. If you're okay with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so then the first being zero security deposit for the one to five trees. So calling the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, seeing none opposed, that carries. The second half, um, making it 30 centimeters instead of 60 centimeters for the protected trees. No, only for those specific trees. Sorry, okay. So the bylaw will read any tree that's 60 centimeters or more is by definition protected. But if it happens to be one of those four species, the limitation is 30 centimeters or more. So basically, you don't need a permit if the tree is under 60 centimeters unless it's one of these defined trees, uh, Arbutus, Gary Oak, Pacific Dogwood, Pacific Yew. Uh, they have their own special definition in the bylaw. And then Douglas fir, grand fir, big leaf maple, and western red cedar would have a separate definition of 30 centimeters. Everything else is 60. I, s I see staff inching. <laughs> Madam Chair, can I suggest that you accept the protected tree as um, submitted by staff, the definition? Um, questions, comments? 
for hesitation from committee. I feel like the recommendation is exactly as recommended by staff that, that that be incorporated into the bylaw. Is this recommendation, thank you, through the chair, is this recommendation consistent with the recommendation from the task force? No, it is not. Okay. The task force wanted anything under 60 centimeters to be exempt. So this is adding those specific trees. Madam Chair, may I clarify a little bit just to kind of mm -hmm. add to what um, Councillor Nolp has said? So the task force recommendation, so where it talks about Arbutus Gary Oak, Pacific Dogwood and Pacific View, that is as recommended by the task force. What the task force did, um, and there was debate, um, was to, um, what the task force said is that any tree having a DBH of 60 centimeters or more so the change in this is that section B that you're looking at. So what it's saying is that for Douglas fir, ground fir, big leaf maple, and western red cedar, that the magic threshold for a protected tree would be 30 centimeters, not 60 centimeters. So that's the decision in front of you. Councillor Nolte, would you concur? Yes, and the remaining protected tree definition C through G still remain exactly as, as they were. So the only addition is that little line in, in B to protect those four species. Madam Chair, can I just uh, ask for clarification? Under the staff recommendation, the Arbutus, Gary Oak, Pacific Dogwood, and Pacific U uh, DBH is still 15 centimeters. Uh, um, and I just want to caution the committee that you'd be hard pressed to find a Gary Oak that ever reaches 30 centimeters DBH. They're a gnarly small tree, even if they're 100 years old. So, yeah. Um, that was one of the trees in my yard that was over 60 centimeters. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, the recommendation will be exactly as on page 27 of 48 in the agenda. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G will be protected. So Arbutus, Gary, Oak, Dogwood, and you are four centimeters or more are protected. So you'll, I don't think you'll ever find a yew tree at 60 centimeters. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, can staff please explain why uh, your, on, on this specific thing around diameter, why the staff report is not consistent with the task force report? <coughs> So staff looked at um, various bylaws around the um, South Island, and we looked at um, there wasn't actually any consistency throughout the South Island, but there were sizes that came up repetitively, 30 centimeters, 60 centimeters. Um, when the task force was reviewing a lot of the information in our bylaw, they referred back to Saanich's bylaw quite often. Um, so the 30 centimeters is consistent with Saanich, as well as some of the other jurisdictions. There are other jurisdictions that are a lot more restrictive than what we are proposing, and even what our original bylaw was. Does that answer your question? The, o the other thing that was taken into consideration was um, when you look at 60 centimeters, to, get, to put it in perspective for you, you can clear cut City Hall here and leave no tree standing unless it was a designated species. So I, I guess to follow up, I guess what I'm concerned about or confused about or not understanding is staff was, staff was part of the task force. And so I'm, I'm assuming that staff participated when the task force began to communicate that they were going to be 60 centimeters and not 30 centimeters. And you did not persuade the task force that, that this was a direction to go and yet once the staff force makes a recommendation, you're going counter to what the staff's. And so I guess my question is, what's the point of having a task force if staff will just sort of make a recommendation outside of what that task force has deliberated on for three months? 
and, it, and, and that's what I'm struggling with and it, trying to find a way to make a major if decision. If I may, not all of the task force agreed with that recommendation. So it wasn't a unanimous <laughs> vote. Uh, I'm, we brought it back to council to consider because that's a, a very important part. Uh, as a wood researcher for over 30 years, I can tell you in this area, a 30 centimeter Douglas fir tree can be 30 meters tall. So, and you don't want to protect that, that's a very significant tree. If you take all of those out of the equation in Colwyn, uh, you're not going to protect very many trees. So I, I think the staff recommendation is, is very reasonable, um, and with all due respect to the task force, I respect what they were trying to do, but I think they went overboard in trying to protect the uh, homeowner's right versus the need of the city to maintain some sort of tree canopy. As I said, I have over 60 trees in my yard. Only two of them would be left if, if we adopted the recommendations of the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, um, staff were there as a supportive role and providing information, but that, um, with that particular subject, staff weren't supportive of that that move to 60 centimeters. Carol, can I ask a question through to Judith, please? So clear me again. You're saying in this protected tree, yep. all trees with a diameter of 60 or greater, staff are saying 30. On, only on or those only those yeah. four species? Yeah. So, so any tree greater than 60 centimeters, staff recommendation is if it's a Douglas fir, ground fir, big leaf maple, or western red cedar, it should be 30 centimeters, and which is a little different than the task force recommendation, but I want to come back to that in a second. Um, and then also, if it happens to be Arbutus scenario, Pacific dogwood, or Pacific yew, down to four centimeters. So it depends on what the species is. So if it's listed here, it can be shown. If it's any other tree, 60 centimeters becomes the magic um, number. There was, um, there was debate at the committee, um, and I was probably one of the people who was pushing for 30 centimeters, so I'm, I'm kind of slightly wearing, I'm, I'm got two hats on at the moment. I've got the sort of Judith hat and the task force hat. Um, the, in the end, the, the agreement from the task force was to go with 60. And one of the reasons driving that was actually consideration of the resources needed for this. Um, the fear was that by going with a, a smaller diameter tree, that staff would end up with a lot more people coming to the counter saying, I need a permit to remove. And I think we were recognizing that um, at this moment in time, the city is not kind of resourced with arborists and, and other folks who um, are in a good position to, to do a lot of that. So it was actually kind of trying to a little bit protect staff and, and city resources. Um, so that was kind of one of the, the driving factors behind that decision. But there was debate to and fro as to what was the, the right magic number. Mm. So I think as a task force, I'm, I'm throwing it back to you guys to, to have the debate on that one. Well, I think I, for me, I'd rather err somewhat on the side of caution, you know, and, and then look down the road if we get over inundated with a bunch of three inch trees that are you know not in the realm of protection and whatever then we'll deal with it but um, to move it forward I you know I, I see the right names in the protected species um, and size wise I think you know the 30 puts us within um, a broader range of what's actually out in our community to look after. So I think I'm okay with that. Okay, anyone else? No? Okay, so call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. Can we get the motion read back? I'm going to ask uh, uh, Councillor Nall to repeat it for me, please. 
the motion would be that protected tree be changed to the definition in the staff recommendation. So that's in my agenda, it's page 27 of 48, and they're items A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Which is making those specific species protected at, sorry, six 30 to six, from 60 to 30, and then adding the four additional species. No. <laughs> the recommendation is four centimeters or more are protected if it's an arbutus, a gary oak, a Pacific dogwood, or a Pacific yew. That's fif uh, four centimeters. 30 centimeters is protected if it's a Douglas fir, a grand fir, a big leaf maple, or a western red cedar. Any other tree is protected if it's 60 centimeters or more, and then the other definitions here are for retained tree, replacement tree, uh, significant tree, and wildlife tree. So it's exactly as worded in the staff report. Okay, everyone's clear now. So call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, one opposed. So that carries. So Okay, so Cynthia. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'd just like to draw your attention to page six of nine of the report in regards to tree removal and uh, um, the recommendations uh, for uh, one tree for calendar year on a property of up to uh, half a hectare. Uh, or an additional tree for each half a hectare up to five trees. Now, um, what, what seems odd to me about that recommendation is that small lot properties are being treated much the same as very large, well-established properties. So, um, you know, taking one tree from a very small lot has a much bigger impact than than taking a tree from a one tree from a very large lot. So um, I'm just finding that that size of half a hectare is too large for what we have here. I, I would say most of the older neighborhoods are are somewhere around a third to a quarter of an acre. Um, in, in size, occasionally a, a large one might be three acres. I could count probably on one hand the number of three to four acre parcels that still exist in the city. But we also have small lots with trees on them um, that are maybe only 500 square meters. So I'm just wondering, is there a, a different designation that, or is that comparable? to the way other bylaws are written? Is that why you, that you've chosen this amount? Uh, through the chair, uh, staff um, didn't choose that half acre. That was the task force's recommendation. Staff's recommendations on um, page seven of nine. Okay. I hadn't caught that, that that wasn't the recommendation. So I was just catching up. Okay, so just asking committee, any other recommendations, questions or comments regarding the task force recommendations? Jason? Um, I just had one question, the tree question of um, 
trees that had been topped already. Uh, I, I know we want to not have topping, but it's an arbor. It, it, it's a good practice if your tree has been topped to continue doing so or develop multiple tops. I'm, I'm not sure the bylaw recognizes that properly. Um, tree topping is in the staff recommendation. It's on page five. So staff are supporting retopping of trees that already pre previously been topped, long as it's done in uh, accordance with sound agricultural practices. Um, what the only variation from the task force recommendation is actually to include it in the body of the language of the bylaw and not as an exemption. Anything else from committee? Cynthia? I just have uh, one further question, which is um, in regards to targeting development for tree retention. Uh, what um, this bylaw seems to me has been brought in to address the problem of uh, our tree canopy disappearing, which is largely largely disappeared as a result of development. So going forward, um, how does this work uh, now with as developments come forward? Will they be required to present a tree retention plan or are they going to be covered under the bylaw as well? So you're referring to cases through you, Madam Chair, you're referring to properties that are subject to either a development permit or rezoning process? Yes. Okay. So currently the process that we use for those particular properties is they have to submit a tree management plan, which includes the trees that will be protected, how they will be protected, the trees that will be removed, the trees that will be replaced, and they also have to bond for that. And so is there limitations on how many trees can be taken out? Do they have to retain a certain amount of trees on the site? Because it involves um, a development permit, it's a more of a negotiated process because it usually involves the uh, addition of new development. Um, and infrastructure work. So staff try to use the policies that are in the uh, OCP around retaining as much as possible the natural vegetation. So it is a more iterative process than this bylaw would be outside of the development permit area. And just my last question uh, is um, that uh, on the first uh, page under the overview, it said staff would be developing a guide to assist the public with the objectives of the official community plan. Now, is that being driven by the OCP or is that being driven by the urban forest management bylaw? Through you, Madam Chair, what staff uh, indicated as part of our uh, meetings with the urban uh, task force is that there were recommendations they were making that didn't necessarily fit within a bylaw, but certainly were appropriate as a policy and as a guideline. So staff in the report have said that we would create a guideline uh, to assist the public in the how the bylaw would be applied. Okay. Um, that doesn't really help me with how this is working. To me, uh, the bylaw has been developed as a result of problems with development and it's targeting residents. And <laughs> so I want to know how are you targeting development? So I'm gonna let Jason sneak in and then staff. Okay, one of the reasons for the bylaw was under the existing structure uh, you can file all those tree management plans and so forth, but if you don't obey them, the only recourse the city had was to take you to court. Now the penalties as defined in this bylaw will apply to each and every tree that are illegally cut. So there's a big financial incentive now for the developers to follow their plan, whereas before there was no incentive. Seeing nothing else from committee? 
one further note. I believe staff was requesting some sort of uh, direction regarding developing an urban forest management plan. Um, I'm not sure how we would go about that uh, other than bring back a report on how much it, what, what it might include and how much it's going to cost. And then council can decide whether they want to uh, provide those um, resources and whether we need to change, uh, maybe have a few extra talents on staff that we don't currently have if we're going to try to enforce that. But uh, So my recommendation would be um, staff bring back a report uh, to committee uh, regarding developing an urban forest management plan and uh, rough estimates of costs. Okay, any comments, questions on that? Uh, Cynthia? I just wanted to add that that, that certainly um, has been something that we've uh, looked at very uh, briefly when we were looking at priority plans uh, in the past. And uh, um, quite often other priorities have gotten in the way. Um, it's certainly um, uh, something that's come out loud and clear through the official community plan process, how important that is to the community. So uh, hopefully uh, when we consider all of the many demands uh, on, on our budgets and our staff, um, that it, it may uh, rank higher this time uh, in finding um, the resources necessary to, to create a plan um, to at least inventory what we have. Uh, because there, there's a lot of um, potential savings uh, in terms of uh, um, identifying what we need to keep rather than identifying later on what we need to plant and what space we don't have to put it in. Okay, uh, call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? None, so that carries. Carol? One more thing, um, from the, the brief email that Rick had sent to me uh, in that he can't be here tonight, everything's been covered off with the exception of um, clarification, I think is what he's looking for mostly, is around having, for residents having to submit a plan if they're taking down more than one tree. But I think discussions with staff, and I would just get it clarified that it's not necessarily a big evolved plan. It's not professional um, reporting or anything. It could simply be Google Map uh, picture with uh, the to accompany the application and, and process. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Basically, what we, what we would be looking for is a site plan identifying the tree to be taken down and where you would be putting the replacement tree. And that could be accomplished with a Google Map and and identifying your trees That's correct. largely. Um, so maybe if the language is a bit confusing, staff could take a look at that and make sure that the it's defined in a way that it's easy to read. Thank you. Okay, I see nothing else from committee. Nope, okay, so there is one final slot for final uh, public participation, anyone? Sorry, I do have one final piece I'm, I'm looking for clarification on, and I think the mayor got me partly there. Um, it's the recommendation dealing with tree removal. So the, the task force had this kind of sort of three category of kind of one tree, two to five trees, and then more than five trees. Um, and the staff recommendations um, eliminate the half a hectare, and I, I get that. Um, but the one that I'm still a bit concerned about in the staff recommendations, so it's saying removal of up to two trees. So there are now two categories. There's kind of two trees and then more than two trees. Um, so two trees a year, permit required, simple site plan, replacement tree at one-to-one, -one, and per your earlier conversation, the security deposit is now gone. Removal of more than two trees a year, permit required, Tree management plan by a qualified person. Um, the task force had anticipated that kind of up to five trees would be, um, again, the sort of the simple not requiring you to hire a, an arborist. And I, I just wanted to kind of clarify where that one's going. 
Um, and and again, security deposit is required for five or more trees, but not below. I'm just I'm not quite sure where it where the direction is at the moment, and I I know that Rip will be asking me. Anyone else from the public? No. I just want to go back to that because that's what I was talking about, it, whether, whether it had to be a qualified person and, and whatever. So in the recommendation, it does say qualified person, but we're accepting a site plan with like a Google map. Uh, you got to run, uh, there's a, through the chair, there's a distinction between one, th one and two trees and more than two trees. So to keep things simple for just removing one or two trees, you just needed a site plan. If you were removing more than two trees, then a, a tree management plan prepared by a qualified person would be required. I don't What's defined as qualified? Currently in the bylaw, it's oh. through the chair. Currently in the bylaw, it's not a defined term, but staff have provo provided um, a definition that would be proposed. So a qualified person means a professional with appropriate education, training and experience fully insured and in good standing with the relevant professional association and includes but not limited to an arborist, professional forester, landscape architect and qualified environmental professional. Some of that language is taken from your OCP draft. So, uh, so sorry, so anything over two trees, we're going to require them to pay for a professional technical re report. Uh, uh, I won't be supporting that. I may make a recommendation. The task force's intention was up to five trees would not require professional. So if we change the staff recommendation, to say removal up to five trees for calendar year, permit, site plan, replacement tree, removal of more than five trees for calendar year, permit, tree management plan, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I will, I will move that to as a consistent with some of the other modification to the staff recommendation. Anything else? Any other discussion on the motion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None. That's carried. Okay, so moving on, uh, five, the final public participation. Was there anything else anyone wanted to say? Nope, okay, so that's number. Uh, just letting everyone know, the next meeting is at the call of the chair. The first and third Monday of each month is reserved for a committee of the whole meetings. And then adjournment. Okay, thank you.